Hello there, and welcome to this very, very long, and I apologize in the beginning, it's going to be a long one, Skull the Hero Slayer video. Welcome back to all of you guys who have been here for a while, and hello and welcome to everyone who is new. This is designed to be a beginner's over-explained video going over me, going from start to finish in a skull run, my decision making, a few tips and tricks along the way, in an attempt to assist new players with learning what enemies do, what kind of decisions to make, and how I like to play the game. I've done a few of these in the past before, but I haven't done one in about three, four months or so now. With some new updates that have just hit, it's time to jump into another one of these. Now, the first and foremost thing, ignore my castle if you're a new player. A lot of this is going to be addressed to you guys. Um, it's all purely cosmetic. The only important thing about the castle you want to be mindful of is the witch and all the NPCs after them. But first and foremost, the most important the witch. The witch traits are one of the most important things for you to upgrade in the game. You will need dark quartz for this. You can see, I'll pull my mouse up on the screen right now. I'm not hurting for dark quartz. We filled out all of our, our talent tree ages ago, and I'm looking pretty, pretty rich on quartz right now. I'm not too worried about that. However, for the beginning of the game, you guys will need your quartz. I will very quickly say right now, the best way to obtain quartz is just to do as much as you can in the run. There is no real strategy for, you know, go up to the first adventure fight or beat the first boss and then reset the run. Your quartz gain uh, increases the longer into the run that you make it. So really the best way to get quartz is just do a run and do your best. There is no strategy, just push as far as you can. If you die, you die. Doesn't matter, you earn some quartz along the way. Come back and put some points in. Now, I will say the most important ones to get, which you probably can't afford straight away because they're a bit pricey, but the most impactful witch traits that you need to get as soon as you can start affording them are the Ancient Alchemy trait and the Reassemble trait. Ancient Alchemy is how you earn money by destroying items. This is quite literally how you sell items. You will earn no money in the beginning of the game for trying to sell an item. You just destroy them, they go away, you don't gain anything from it. And this really devalues item rooms in the game and devalues making decisions to obtain items. There are a few unique and special rooms in the game that try and reward you with an item if you decide to accept the challenge. And in those circumstances, if you don't want the item, those rooms have zero value, whereas at least with this, you will have a chance to sell them and get some money. Now, reassemble is your second life. Um, this is like, you know, your death's defiance, you know, your, your, your second life bar, basically. When you die, you'll come back with extra. At one out of two, it's only 30%. At two out of two, it's 60%. Uh, same for Ancient Alchemy, at 1 out of 2 you're only going to earn half the gold as if you get 2 out of 2. All of the other traits are very, very, very useful. This one gives you a shield on swap. We have extra skill cooldown speed for balance types right here. This line is actually um, unique to each different type of skull. People often ask what's the difference between speed, balance, and uh, power. The difference is some of them just get extra passives. So cooldown speed for balance skulls, uh, damage reduction for power skulls, and attack and movement speed for... Uh, speed skulls. Now, in addition to that, you get a lot of universal stuff like quintessence cooldown, max life, swap cooldown is a very good one, uh, magic and physical attack boost, and basic crit rate. These are all very useful. You want to get them all filled out eventually. But like I said, these two in the back here, very, very, very good standouts. Now, assuming that you played through the game a little bit, you've most likely already rescued the fox NPC, maybe even the ogre NPC. You'll find the fox, I believe, still in Act 1, and the Ogre in Act 2. You probably won't find the Druid just yet if you're not getting up to uh, Act 3 or beyond. However, the Fox is very, very handy. He's the guy that will give you a free skull at the beginning of your run. And you you can't make it up. I get the, uh, the Genie, which is my example to tell you guys that the Fox and the Ogre both have a chance to give you rare items and skulls. So you don't always get commons. You can get rares as well. It's about a 10% chance in my experience. So, you know, 1 in 10 chance that you're going to get a rare. This is very valuable, uh, regardless of what you are given, because you can destroy these for more fragments for the skulls, or if you have the alchemy trait, you could destroy them for more money, even if you don't want them. So let's assume I don't want to do a physical run. I can still take this stuff, and it's still worth money to me, so it's a good head start on the run. Uh, additionally, you can pay... 10 extra quartz, very cheap in my opinion, very cheap, to both NPCs, and they will give you a second skull or item. You can only get two items or two skulls from these guys, so I get my two skulls there. If I talk to the ogre again and pay 10 more quartz, he will give me another item. 
Now, this is a great way to get head starts. If I, for example, just didn't want to use either of these skulls, destroy them both. There's 16 fragments. What a great head start. That's an upgrade already for a common. We're halfway to a uni uh, unique upgrade. Perfect. However, for this, I will start with the werewolf, and I'm going to let the genie stay here and uh, not use him. In fact, I can destroy him, and I've got 11 fragments. So my werewolf already has enough fragments to get to rare when I go and upgrade him. Fantastic, right? I come over here, we've got the basic staff, we've got the toxic pendant. I take both of these. I may not want to keep the staff because werewolf, especially this one, is all physical damage. You can tell because the word physical damage is written in orange. <laughs> they highlight it so that you can tell what it is. And then you can tell what items are buffing your physical damage because, as you can see, increase physical attack by 20%. You may as well see them as colors. What does my werewolf do? My werewolf does orange. What does this boost? Orange. Fantastic. This item is helpful. This boosts blue. Magic attack. That doesn't help me. What it does do is help this guy right here. Skull with his head toss ability. It won't help his pass the baton ability though. Hmm. This guy is a little bit of a weird hybrid. So from that, we can now go over here to the druid. Talk to his little chalice thing, which gives us a buff. The buff is basically just there to help you get through act one a bit quicker. I believe the buff automatically disappears in act two anyway. So even if you rush... It doesn't matter. Let's drop off the side, head down, and begin our run. Now, doors. We are given an opportunity here. I will very quickly go over the doors. The green ones with all the skulls around them. That's right, skull doors. We get new characters in here and opportunities to destroy them and get more fragments. We have the treasure chest doors. Lots of loot and stuff all around the door. These give you items. And the plain looking doors, I might point them out if I see one, are just raw gold. If you are just starting out and you do not have the ancient alchemy trait from the witch that lets you sell items, these rooms are a little bit less incentivized. Yes, you can get items in here and yes, you should still take them. But the fact that you cannot sell your items yet means that you can't financially gain from going into these rooms. That's why that trait is so good, because once you have it filled out, you no longer really need to take the basic money rooms because these rooms are always going to be better for you. In the beginning, however, I like to take skull rooms in order to try and either upgrade the skull that I'm using or find a better skull that I would rather use in my run. So coming into a skull room, let's go forward and just start wiping out some of these dudes. Act one is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You'll find some, you know, some tricky rooms that have, you know, a lot of traps and enemies all over, but don't worry too much. Now, I have a really rare chance to tell you guys about a, a weird tip and I've accidentally gone too far with it, but we'll go back and explain it anyway. Up here, enemies are supposed to spawn. You can either choose to go down and below and go across the spike trap here and kill this tree here and then go all the way down the bottom. And you can even finish the room and never go up the top. But if you were to go up the top before you get to enter the room, enemies will spawn and continue to try and attack you. You, are, you can effectively skip rooms by avoiding spawning them. They're, they're like set conditions that make them appear, like coming up here. And if you don't meet that condition, they won't spawn, the game doesn't see that there's enemies in, on the screen, and you can end the room early. It's it's a weird niche little tip, but I figure I mention it now because I know someone in the comments is going to do that. Now we have Petty Thief. Petty Thief does magic damage. Now what I can do here is actually split my run between a magic skull and my werewolf who is a physical skull because I've been given a physical and magical item. And because I don't really know how the RNG of the game is going to treat me, Am I going to get a lot of magic items, a lot of physical items? Why not take one of both? That way, depending on what the game does for me, I can benefit from this. Um, little side note, Skull himself does not sell for any fragments, so getting rid of him isn't really a negative at all because you can always benefit from selling whatever other Skulls you've got. Leaving him behind here doesn't hurt us. However, I will say, Little Basic Skull is not a bad Skull. I've done many, 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 many runs where I play with just Little Basic Skull on his own, and those runs are very powerful and absolutely fine. Um, you don't have to ditch him at all. Don't think that just because he's the guy you start with, he's bad. He's actually way better than some of the other Skulls in the game. Now, uh, big dude up here. When you're far away, he shoots balls. When you're up close, he stomps the ground. He'll still spit balls. You can dash through projectiles, though. Um, either avoid them completely, or if he's going to be nice to me and let me demonstrate. Spit your balls. Um, you can dash through them and destroy the projectiles. So you have complete invincibility on that. Do not worry. It's not the end of the world if you dash into one. The iframes are fantastic. We have the rejuvenating root. 
taking damage restores some life one second cooldown it's kind of you know it's an it's an okay ish item you know it's just it's doing what it's doing you know it, it's playing its part it's not like fantastic but then again what do you expect um the way that items and skulls are set to appear is based on where you are in the run so in act one and two you're more likely to see common and rare items and then in act three and four you're more likely to see unique and legendary items the rarity of things do get um an increase the further in the run you get so don't expect amazing things in the beginning but you can still find them it's just that your chances are reduced you can find legendary skulls and items in act one and you admittedly very rarely can still find uh, weaker stuff in act three and four but it's it's much harder to find weaker stuff later on than it is to find rare stuff early on it's it's weird i know but that's just the way that it works now, coming into the next shop, what do we have in here? I need to see... Um, that's the first shop, actually. I said next shop. I, habit. Don't ignore me. Habit. So, we have four items on display. New update put the fourth item space here. Very, very handy. Now, I get to decide what kind of a run I want to do. If I want physical, do I want magical? Do I want a niche kind of inscription -y kind of build? Like, do I want to do absolute zero over here and do a very dominant freeze build? Do I want to take this armor and do a fortressy tanky build? There's a lot that you can do. Now, having said that, going for inscriptions isn't always mandatory. You don't have to always take every item that has the same synergy. It's kind of like a mix match situation. You might have one inscription that you dominantly want to take, and then one or two inscriptions that you only want a little bit of. For example, wisdom for magic skulls. If you can get four wisdom, go for it. It makes magic skulls way stronger. If you can only get two for the two set bonus to get that 20% amp, that's also just fine. You don't have to hunt them to the ends of the earth, even though I sometimes do. You can kind of, you know, play it a little bit more reserved, a little bit more calm, and not go all in. Now, something that I will say is the Carlane Insignia is a very good item to get nice and early. It is an item that increases your gold gain by 30 for how many Carlane items you have. So we have the Carlane Staff and the Carlane Insignia. It does count itself. That way, on its own, you are always going to get 30 gold per room whenever you walk into a new room. However, because of the staff, we're going to get 60. Now, the earlier we buy this, the better. We paid about, what, 500 gold for that? So 60 gold per room, you know, within about, you know, 10 or so rooms, we will have more than paid off for, you know, nine, eight rooms even. And we'll more than pay off what we've already paid for it and then be earning extra money after that. It will start to earn money for us, which is very handy once again, if you don't have that alchemist trait. I'm gonna keep hammering at home because that's how important it is. You could also buy the armor here for another 500, so you get 90 gold every time you walk into a room instead of 60, but for the purposes of this run, I'm gonna ignore that and re-roll and try and find something else. Now, we've been given, ooh, ooh, we've been given something kind of interesting here. We've been given the Carlean Sword, which is another Carlean item. It's physical and it has courage on it, which is kind of like the physical equivalent, equivalent, ugh, my tongue, to wisdom on the staff so what i might do is i'll take the sword which benefits our werewolf and i have the staff that benefits the thief and the sword that benefits the werewolf we've kind of split the run in terms of who's getting buffed in what way now adventure fight i have in my part one guide of my youtube guide on how to uh deal with skulls act one i've explained every adventure fight i will leave a link to this video in the description below where every single one of these adventurers is explained in depth how to beat them, what to do against their attacks, um, and how to deal with their ultimate moves. Uh, for this run, I'm not going to over explain it too much. I'm going to, I'm actually let her do this attack real quick. So for this attack right here, for the, the Sorceress Girl, you can kind of slow walk away. Like it's a really, really easy fireball attack to avoid once you stop panicking and just kind of stand still. <laughs> it really beats itself. Uh, down she goes. Once again, if you need help with all the other adventurers, whether it be Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, because the first three acts of adventurers, they're all the same. They just add more of them into the fights. Uh, check out that video down below, and I will have uh, sections highlighted down there on how to deal with each one of them. Um, each adventure fight will give you rewards. It will give you one skull, one quintessence, and one item. You can choose one of these. Uh, Flame Dragon is a unique quintessence. It's a very good quintessence at a pretty high rarity. If I wanted to, I would say, for example, either destroy Pike, swap the, the Thief for it. I could also take the Broken Dagger, which is a very nice item that comes with attack speed and a chance to inflict a wound, which is effectively, you know, the bleed status effect in the game. 
It comes with excessive bleeding already on it and Hidden Blade, which are both pretty decent inscriptions. Now, what do I want to do? Do I want to try and go for more items? Do I want to get the dragon nice and early? I might think I want to take the dragon nice and early. Getting a good quintessence early in your run can be very, very beneficial. It's like an extra ability that can do huge amounts of damage or provide huge amounts of support for you. And since our other options here are a common dagger and a common, common skull, it doesn't really matter, right? We're not missing out on too much. If I was hard focused on getting a bleed build, this is one of the important pieces I need to take this. If I was hard focused on getting pike for a pike build, obviously here he is, I need him. But thanks to destroying genie at the beginning of our run, I have enough fragments to upgrade my werewolf if I want to. I'm going to take the dragon and move on into the next room. After every adventure and every boss, a Rachne appears. She upgrades your skull for you, depending on how many fragments you've got and what skull you're upgrading. To go from common to rare, you need to pay at least 10 fragments. To go from rare to unique, it's 30. And then from unique to legendary, it's 100. Which means to get from common to legendary, you need a whopping 140 uh, fragments from skulls. And to get from, say, just unique to legendary, it's only 100. So it costs more long term to get a common skull to legendary than it does someone who's already a higher level naturally. But I will say right now and put an end to a myth, there is no inherent benefits or negatives to whether or not your skull comes at a higher rarity or not. There are unique skulls like, say, Predator, Berserker, Ninja, etc. They are just as strong at Legendary as a common, like Werewolf and Thief, that have been upgraded to Legendary. Everyone kind of ends at the same playing field. It's just that some skulls are a little bit better than others, but ultimately, if you're a Legendary skull, you're not, you know, hindered because you started off as a little common boy. That's not something I want you guys to get stuck in your head. Now, because I have enough fragments and I can afford to do this, I'm going to upgrade my werewolf because now that I have flame dragon on my side, there's a lot more physical support for this run than there is magical. Moving forward, now we have a basic money room and an item room. If you don't have the alchemist trait and you're willing to gamble, you can go into an item room and see what you get. However, hypothetically, if you received a magic item like the staff, you can't sell it. You can't do anything with it. You haven't gained as much from going into that room as you would have going into the gold room because at least with that gold you can choose what items you want to buy in the store so because i have the alchemist trait i will go in here and do the item room but like i said if you don't have the alchemist trait it might might with a capital emphasis on gambling might be more worth your while to uh uh, take the the item room if you want to gamble otherwise i'd say play it safe and take the gold room in the beginning but once you get the alchemist trait i would suggest just taking the item rooms every turn of the way like just don't ignore the regular rooms after that um unless you're forced to go into them like in this situation here because the other door isn't available and it's been destroyed growing volition concentration related item werewolf doesn't concentrate on his abilities it's not really useful to us but what it is is a unique item so hypothetically let's say i came in here and i didn't have the trait I can't sell this, it's useless. But because I do have the trait, I can eventually sell this for 562 gold. Not a bad trade-off. Ah, we've been given a rare room. Now, the rare rooms in Skull appear randomly. Um, you'll know if you get one if it lags a little bit before you come in. And they can give you anything from items to quintessences to uh, sometimes skulls and, and uh, currencies like gold and fragments and even some quartz here and there. There's all sorts of different special rooms. These are completely randomized. They'll show up whenever they feel like it. Now, this room right here is offering Nias, which is a rare quintessence that has a lot of magic stuff built into it. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. The condition for this one is if you activate the uh, mechanism by taking the item, these three crystals will activate and you have to destroy them while being shot by arrows. If you destroy them all and don't die, you get to leave the room. Otherwise, you don't get to leave the room. Now, if you touch it, just, just taking this at all will activate the event. I'm going to swap back to Flame Dragon and kind of just use Flame Dragon to do a lot of the work for me here and destroy all of the crystals because I can cheese it. But this room will shoot a lot of arrows at you and you have to destroy all these crystals in time. Well, there's not really a timer. Your life bar is the timer. If you're a new player, I suggest not doing this unless the thing on, on supply here is really, 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 really nice and you really want to take it. Otherwise... You might lose more life in this room than it's worthwhile. I would suggest waiting until you're more confident with mobility, with the damage that you're dealing before you commit to doing a room like that. If you don't want to do it, just walk out. You don't have to commit to it whatsoever. Grab the gold, move into the next shop, 
And we have, ah, we have some pretty neat stuff over here. We have the broken dagger that we passed up last time is back. We have the Manitek Cogwheel, which has magic attack on it. Don't need that for my werewolf run. Kendo stick, attack speed, pretty good for us. Arms, increases physical attack, pretty good for us. And rapidity, which is extra attack speed, pretty good for us. It's not bad. This is a pretty decent item. I have enough money to afford this. I can, I'm just going to take it. Now, I would still like to get the broken dagger. Now, I'm not too sure if bleed is the best way to go, but that extra attack speed, I mean, we just grabbed an item that already boosts our attack speed. If I get another rapid item, it's only going to get stronger and faster. So why not take an item that also increases my attack speed and has pretty decent inscriptions on them to begin with? I wonder what I could do. I know what I could do. I could sell an item because I have my witch trait. This is where the witch trait comes in being so handy. If I didn't have it, I can't do anything else. I have to leave. But because I do, I can sell my growing volition because like I said, concentration does nothing for us. Some of you are saying, but Beals, you've got a magic staff. That also does nothing for your werewolf. And you're right, it doesn't. But what it is still doing is synergizing with Carlane Insignia. I'm gaining 30 gold from every room just by having this in my inventory. Growing Volition isn't really doing anything for me because I don't have the inscriptions necessary to actually get any benefits. And its main effect is doing nothing. Plus, if I sell it by holding in my button, I get a decent chunk of money back so I can buy my broken dagger and then waltz my way out of the room, feeling happy that I've made some good transactions. Yay, good for us. Come down here, start attacking some dudes. You can see our damage is already going up nicely. We're attacking fast, we're attacking loud and proud. Um, avoid all the damage from these mage guys. Get a bit fancy, you know, smack these dudes around. Uh, 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 the thorny, viney things up here can be a little bit intimidating, but you can literally walk past them and not get hit by them. They do swing that slow. Zip on through and we have a pile of gold and once again, the option between an item room or a skull room. Now I've only got one bone fragment left. I'm feeling like I want to get some more fragments so I can continue to upgrade my werewolf. This room's annoying. Totems! I think this is the first totem I've seen. I'm not sure if I've seen one earlier. All of these little shrine totem looking thingies, totems, uh, they buff your enemies while they are active on the map. This is giving a magic and physical attack boost to any of the enemies nearby. You can see they've all got a little glow on them down there. There is also a shield totem. It looks like a big shield. It gives them hyper armor so you can't stagger them by hitting them. There's also a speed one. That's the blue one. That looks like a wing. That gives them a movement and attack speed boost. And then lastly, what's the last one I'm forgetting? The green healing one. Big green cross. That gives them a life regeneration over time. Guess what? Destroying these gives you that boost. Down the very bottom left corner. I'm trying to dodge this while I'm explaining. These are all your buffs and debuffs. That little uh, jumping skeleton in the corner here. That is an extra life. That's my exoskeleton perk. And the red swords that are crossed mean I'm getting a bonus to my attack while it is active. I also have the red glow that they had before. You want to destroy totems in your runs to prevent your enemy from having buffs and to give them to yourself because isn't that nice? We're basically stealing their technology. We are nasty about it. You don't have to do it, but I still recommend it. Um, Mage is a magical boy. I'm not trying to do a magical run. I'm trying to do a physical run. One of the most important things I will say for a lot of new players is to try and identify nice and early what type of run you want to do. And it's very easy to discern that by deciding between magical and physical. This guy's going to go on a bouncy ride, isn't he? <laughs> no, die, die, die. Um, because sometimes people flip and flop back and forth and they're like, oh, I'm going to do a magical run. Oh, dude, uh, uh, this really good rider just dropped. He's a physical boy. I'm going to go to physical instead of magic. And then all of a sudden... Warlock drops and they're like, oh, I want to take Warlock. And they end up flipping and flopping their items all over the place. They change what kind of damage they're doing so often that the build kind of falls apart. Um, you don't have to decide in Act 1 what you want to do. You can change your build at any point, but it does help to start building a run early like I'm doing right now with my physical damage here and some extra attack speed. I've even got my necklace doing some poison and more physical damage. And that's going to help you out long term with keeping the flow of your build. If I find a better physical skull along the way, I can take it and know full well that my items are still helping me. First boss, Yggdrasil. Once again, I have a guide video that goes into more detail about what he does, but for the most part, grrr, dodge out the way. Big fist. Use this time to get some attacks in. Grrr, dodge out the way. Now, the fist will always come from whatever side you're closest to, 
So if I'm on the right side, he always does two. There's fist number one. He's going to do one. You ass. You ass. This is right. He do he's doing it because he's going into a special attack. If he does special attack, which also requires you just run away and jump over the balls, he then, you know, his gem gives him an issue, so he, he falls down. And then he goes back to doing his attacks. Now, right side, fist. There's fist one. If I stay on the right side, guess which fist is going to come at me? The right side fist. You can always tell which fist if you pick a side. You can kind of cheese it that way and always um, make him use the fist that's easiest to dodge. Smack, smack, smack. Do the swipes. I want to show the swipes. Do the swipies. He's not going to do the swipies, is he? Swipies. Nah, uh, he's, he's just going to keep doing this for a minute. I'd rather show you the first phase swipies, but, you know, he's not going to do it. The swipe across the screen, assuming he's not going to play ball, is exactly the same as the giant poundy fists. He will always swipe from the fist that's closest to you. Jump up and jump over it, you know, up and over, all that kind of stuff. You can stand on a platform, but even just from standing flat on the ground, you can jump up with a double jump and dash over it and be fine. Finally, dude. All right, right side fisties. I'm going to come over here. Right side fisties. You can always tell what side is coming. You can actually, like, you know, you can influence that, basically. Phase two. He does a lot of the same stuff, but it's now faster. So, big fisties. It's just faster. So, like, dash, dash, wait a second, dash, dash. Dash, dash, wait a second, dash, dash. And you can always avoid the fist. If you get mixed up and you dash to the left and he does the right side fist, just be mindful of where you're standing. Now, these swipies, he alternates. He'll always do one than the other. Once again, dash, dash. Wait a second, dash, dash, and then get over and above it. You can use these little platforms here to get some leverage. I find that sometimes it's hard to do that. His phase two ultimate move, he's just going to summon balls from all over the sky. Um, admittedly, you might just get bad RNG, but for the most part, just eyeball it and dash appropriately. I find that overcompensating with your dash can often be a bigger issue than, than uh, taking it slow. I see people, they start to panic and they're like, <gasps> and they're running all over the screen, getting freaked out. And then they're going to more often than not walk into one of those projectiles more than if they just sat still and waited. Now, he does have a final attack here that he hasn't shown off. I would like you to show it. He slams the ground a couple of times. It's a lot easier just because, you know, he, um, he kind of uh, shows off what he's going to do before he does it. And it's a bit easier to tell what you need to do, but he's not going to, is he? All right, let's try and avoid this and do what I said. Be very calm and just react to the ones that are nearby. But he does this move where he slams the ground three times. He does slam, slam, then he waits and he slams a third time. No, he's not going to do it. After a second, you can just jump in the air, wait out the first two slams, and then avoid the final one after that. But ultimately, Yiggy is not the biggest issue in the world. Um, once you start getting his patterns down, you'll be fine with him. Practice, practice, practice. Now, Yggdrasil dies, and we get da -da 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 -da, our big flurry of items. This is part of the new 1.6 update that came out recently. Some of you guys who are watching this, you know, around the time I release this video, maybe won't have this on consoles yet, but the console version will be getting this update very soon, and uh, everyone will get the options of choosing from an array of items from the loot chest after beating a boss fight. So we get to even better uh, funnel down and decide what kind of a run we want to do. However, having said that, when dashing, thrust forward, and deal damage, I mean, cavalry's all right. We've got Nias again. Elder Ent's Gratitude isn't very nice. I don't like it very much. The Ice Ball, this is for a freezy kind of build. Lie Weasel's Quintessence, magic-related. Boots are magic-related. Sphinx, I've already got Dragon. Dragons are much better Quintessence. And if I had used it in the Yggdrasil fight, it would have been over way quicker. Huh. In a situation like this, having the Witch Traits can be very handy because I would recommend choosing the highest rarity item here, which is an, as a rare, and then sell that for the most money. But because it's, you know, neither here nor there, and I don't have max items yet, may as well take the cavalry. That way, whenever I dash, I'm now doing a little cute attack whenever I do it. But if I don't want to keep it, I'll just sell it eventually. I mean, that's that's the idea, right? If you don't have a good contestants already, try and grab one from there if it, you know, is what you'd like. Otherwise, sell the highest rarity thing, or just take something that's, you know, placeholder. You know, you can get rid of it later. Now, once again, Arachne appears after every boss and adventurer fight. I am very short on fragments, so I'm just going to move on and go into a skull room. Yay, my little cavalry poke. Let's go. <laughs> it's cute, right? So now my dash has a damaging component to it. Handy dandy dandy. 
And I'm going to explain some of these enemies in Act 2 a little bit more once I can isolate some of them. But this room is pretty bad for that because there's a lot of dudes in here. I want to isolate that spear guy because I feel as though spear guy gives people issues, right? You might be a new player and you're seeing that spear guy and you're having anxiety already. Let me, let me see if I can clear out the little guys on their own and avoid spear dude long enough to... There we go. Now... First major enemy of Act 2. Act 2 is where the enemies start to get a little bit more aggressive. And by a little bit more, I mean, yikes, they want you to die. Spear Dude has two attacks. The basic Spear Poke, which you can see when he raises his shield forward, he's going to rush at you. He's always going to do that. You can jump over it. You can dash past it. The cavalry thing might put me in trouble here if I kill him by accident. Um, either way, avoiding his attack isn't the hardest thing in the world. That overhead swing right there. Let me see if he'll do it here. Buddy. Buddy. It has a deceptively high hitbox on it. So much so that he won't hit me with it. Oh, oh my god. Basically, if he was standing just under here, which he's not going to get to because he keeps zipping back and forth. Stand over here. No, no, no. There we go. See, my, my heirloom saved me right there, my inscription. Go. Do it again. Thank you. Yay. Uh, try not to be above them. Try to stay on level with them. Smack them after they after they rush at you. You can dodge past them, then walk up and hit them. Or jump over them. It's up to you. They're not the hardest thing in the world to avoid. However, they do have hyper armor after they have begun doing the poke. Hyper armor is the yellow aura around an enemy. You'll notice it if there's a shield totem nearby. You cannot stagger those guys. So much like the big beefy charges, they just don't care if you're hitting them. Harpy Knight, NPC. Gives you about 25 fragments for rescuing her. Do it every time. It's great. She is random though. All the NPCs that you can find in cages are random. The earlier you find some of them, the better. Warrior again. Let him be destroyed. You don't have to manually destroy them. You can leave them on the ground. Remember, they will be destroyed automatically. You don't have to waste time sitting there holding in the button. We did gain our 11 fragments for Warrior's Demise. Now this room. Oh, what a great room to show off the maids. I know a lot of people love the maids, right? You guys just adore the maids. So, <laughs> the maids are a problem, right? The maids are a problem. People don't like the maids. I'm going to see if I can just save one large maid. Because um, it is the large maids that are the problem. The little ones are annoying, but the big the big ladies are the reason why they're annoying. And I'm going to do my best to, to just clear the room. You know, if you're, if you're not sure how to handle the maids... You know, watching what I'm doing can help a little bit, but let me just let me just deal with this. Now, big maid lady likes to summon... I'm going to get rid of this totem. Healing totem. No healing for you guys. Large maid lady summons three maids out of a door. Magical door. There are always two blondes and one redhead. The blondes are the melee attacking maids. They smack you with their brooms. The redheads, which are sometimes the most annoying, will jump towards you or over you and throw dinner plates. Now, the best way to avoid these attacks is easy. Uh, just run. Just just literally hold a direction, and if they swing preemptively, dash. But for the most part, their attacks are relatively slow, and they have no hyper armor. They've got low life. These little ones die pretty easily. Now, the redheads. The redheads, you can just walk underneath the plates, right? So she's going to run around. She's going to, yep. Walk under. Don't jump. If you see a redhead there, don't jump. She wants you to jump. She wants to hit you with the plates. You can just walk under them, right? Once again, low life. Now, something I need to point out very, very importantly about the big maid, though. She has a dinner bell attack. The dinner bell attack is relatively slow. You can quite literally outrun it by just moving away. So if I start to run, it's, it's not going to come anywhere near hitting me. It will hit you if you stand still. So what the maid wants you to do is panic. She wants you to start freaking out because there's blondes swinging at you. There's a redhead throwing plates. Panic, panic, panic. You start jumping. Oh, no, I'm getting hit by dinner plates. Uh, you start standing still to avoid the dinner plates. Ah, and then the bell hits you, right? And then the blondes hit you. Now, you're asking yourself, why isn't she bringing out more maids? Well, that's her secret. The large maid will only summon new maids once all three of the original ones are dead. So a strategy that you can do, and I recommend this, is you can kill two maids. Say, for example, the two blondes like I just did right there. And then leave one behind. And look, that little redhead, she doesn't want to fight. She's running all over the place. I can just avoid her and then take my time and bully the larger maid. Uh, look at that. 
I killed the last maid though, so I need to kill her fast before she does anything. <laughs> and that's the secret to the maze. In this room in particular though, this is a nightmare room. This room wants to kill you. This is a really bad room to get if you're if you're a new player. Um, I wish you luck. I hope you've got a good quintessence. I hope you've got some practice. You can handle this room. It's not impossible. Worst case scenario. Bait a bunch of the maids over to the far left corner. Kill all but two maids. So one summon maid from each one of these larger ones. And then try and run back in and kill the big maids when their friends aren't around. But ultimately the maids are the first major, major, major difficult enemy for players to face. Don't feel bad if you're having a hard time with it. Everyone does in the beginning. And uh, power through. Power through is what I will say. Now, next shop. Prayer of Grace, Stigma Leg, Ring of the Wind, mm, and Grudge Stone. I could take the Ring of Wind for extra attack speed. It synergizes with our attack speed setup right here. However, I know Ring of Wind won't stick around very long. I have a habit of getting rid of it, you know, relatively quick after buying it. I'm going to re-roll the shop. Uh, Solar Sword has arms. I can see that we've already got some arms already by holding in my down button on the top of the item. So getting this item will give me that inscription for arms and I get 45% more physical attack in addition to 40% from the item itself. So 85 sounds good, you know, it's just a good inscription. And the sun and moon inscription is very unique in that if you find a way of getting two solar swords or two lunar rings, which is the other item, the moon component of this item set, or if you get the lunar, the, uh, the lunar ring with the solar sword, they combine into a special awesome new weapon. So I'm gonna buy the solar sword and, you know, I'm not going to lie, cross my fingers that we find the Lunar Ring. But, you know, even if I don't, we've got the Solar Sword, extra damage, and uh, very, very good, very handy. Don't want any of these, although, wait, no, Acceleration Sword, I have spoken too soon. Acceleration Sword not only has arms, which continues to boost our arms inscription, we get Rapidity, which gives us 30% more attack speed. In addition to that, the Accelerating Sword will attack and damage enemies every 14 seconds, but... The faster attack speed will swing the sword faster. So because we've already got some good attack speed, it's just a faster attack. Now, out of all the items I have, I would say the Rejuvenating Root is the one I care about the least. So I'm going to get rid of that and replace that with our new Accelerating Sword. Once again, you can just leave the Root on the ground. In fact, in the shop, I recommend it. Because what often happens is you drop an item on the ground. Now, as soon as an item is on the ground in your inventory. As soon as it's not in the shop, it is no longer in the loot pool. You cannot re-roll the shop, for example, and gain any of the items already in your inventory or sitting on the ground right there. So by leaving the root on the ground, it is no longer a possibility when re-rolling. Whereas if I were to sell this item on the ground right now, it can appear in the shop. And sometimes, I'm telling you, more often than not, I will end up finding that item on the first re-roll. So if I leave that there and I re-roll the shop now, Hmm, what do I see? What do I see? Anything I want? Not particularly. I'm going to do one more reroll, but I want you to pay attention to my gold. I have 1280 gold right now. I can see that on average, most of these items that we're finding are selling for about a thousand gold. If I reroll, which costs 530, I will go down by a little bit of gold, right? I'll go down just a little bit in gold. I won't be able to afford a thousand, but... Our root, which is worth 350 gold, is sitting right there. In addition to that, I know I'm going to have to sell an item from my inventory in order to afford whatever I want to buy anyway. But even though I re-roll and we've now gone below the threshold of how much I need, I could say... Sell this. Ah, I can afford all these items now. In addition to that, I would still need to sell something. So, you know, it all works out. Now we have the disposable syringe here. All these other items, you know, uh, the staff is magic. This is mostly magic. This is just life. This syringe, however, critical hits inflict poison. Now, Werewolf is a character who likes to do a lot of critical damage. I recommend strongly read your character's inscription uh, uh, details. Find out what they do. You've got increased movement and dash distance. That's nice. When enemies are defeated, movement speed and dash is increased. That's nice. However, as he upgrades higher, he will gain more critical damage as his unique mechanic. So because the werewolf is going to be good at doing crits, it might be worthwhile to take an item that synergizes with critical hits. So I'm going to dispose. I think it's finally time to get rid of the staff. Everything else that we have is synergizing with our build in some way. This does physical damage and we're dashing a lot. Everything else is either attack speed or damage. We've got our money gain right here. The staff is the odd one out. Let's replace the staff. Now, once again, 
you can walk away. That 352 gold, I can just leave the room. I'm going to take a skull room here. I got my gold. Look at that. Do not freak out about walking away and leaving the room early. Oh, I'd love to show you guys the archers, but the archers are a bit tricky. Okay, so from up here, the green archer guys will always shoot straight at you. There's a red line to indicate their, their attack coming towards you. Simple enough. But moving close to them will always trigger them to jump back. This is on like a, I'm going to say like a five second cooldown internal for them. So they won't always do it. But the first time, if I walk up to him right now, he's going to jump back and fire two arrows as he does this. So I can do two things. I can walk up to him and then jump and dash in the air and guarantee avoid those arrows or react to him jumping back and then dash forward and immune through his damage. So if I walk up to him, avoid the first shots and he jumps up. Guarantee. He won't do it now for a few seconds, but I know that he will do it. Probably next. I don't want to accidentally get hit by these little dudes down here. Can you go? There we go. Bear in mind, he has two things that he can do and that's it. That's all he does. We are gradually going to get through all of these enemies in this act, I swear to you. Um, big dude, over here, big dude. Can you come over here on your own? Fantastic. Also has a shoulder charge. They're basically copies of the guys from Act 1, except this Axe Slam now sends out a projectile. Guess what? You can literally deal with them exactly the same. You can get over here. If you're against the wall, if they turn left, look, just walk past them, dude. Walk past them. Is he going to tackle at me? Nah, he's going to do an Axe Slam. I can stand over here. I can dash over it. I can dash through it. Basically the same as the Act 1 guys. Just, you know, a projectile's been added. The really tricky part is when you start adding all these enemies together. Now, iframes. Spear dude can be bullied as long as he's not in the middle doing an attack. I've got arrows coming at me. I've got arrows over here coming at me. That guy's going to jump back. That guy's going to jump back. They're all doing their jump back nonsense. Once they've jumped back at least once, those few seconds after they do their jump back arrow shot is your chance to get in there and do some damage to them. The shield dudes are barely worth mentioning. They just hold a shield, walk past them, hit them from behind. You know, they, they telegraph their sword swing very, very obviously. They raise their sword and go, Aah! and then try and swing. Don't get hit by that. NPC, she's going to give us a random buff. She can buff magical attack, physical attack. She can buff max life. She can buff attack speed and critical hit chance. We just got the critical hit chance buff, right? Fantastic. That's going to help us with our syringe that we got and werewolf already being a big attacker with critical hits. I am running out of air. Now, shield dude. Oh no, he's holding up a shield, but what's that? The traps in area two also damage the enemies, which I couldn't get to happen a second time because my sword destroyed it. But you saw the arrow from that little uh, turret statue went through the enemies and damaged them. Some of the traps in the game do indeed hurt enemies as well. Take advantage of that. It's like the explosive barrels that you can see and the dinner plates. Do you have any idea how many people I know who don't know that dinner plates are projectile? And they do a lot of damage. Smack them in the direction of an enemy and feel very smart and sensationally happy with yourself that you were able to do that. Now, extra, 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 extra little bit of advice. All of the small maids that are summoned by the larger maid are not counted as mandatory enemies. This maid right here, don't have to kill her. I don't have to kill her. I'll take your attention to the mini map. That little red dot down there, that's the dinner plate maid. That's the enemy waiting upstairs. This little one in the corner is telling me how many enemies left I have to kill to leave the room. If I walk into here, that number changes as new enemies spawn. Ah, look at that. I'm leaving. Here's the shield dude waiting for me. Walk past him, hit him from behind. She, uh, little, little arrow dude here. Now the arrow dude is standing on spike traps, but I don't think, nah, he's gonna, he's gonna jump away. If I get him to leap back onto those, what? There we go. You can set off those traps and damage the dude and you are, <laughs> you can, you can really take advantage of that. These spike traps activate so slowly that you can literally just walk across them. As long as you don't stand still on them, you're fine. Magical choker. It's magical. I don't want it. I don't want to replace anything of mine. I can leave it there to be destroyed on its own. Just a reminder, just a reminder that dinner plate maid is still down here. I can leave the room. I don't have to kill her. There are a few enemy types in the game that aren't considered mandatory. Pretty much all of them are summoned by other enemies. When we get to act three, we'll see more of this. But for now, let's move on 
that choker gets destroyed and we get the money that we are owed. Now, Act 2's adventurer fight. There are now two of them. The ninja is here along with the priest lady. Once again, like I said, you can check out my uh, my guide in the previous uh, guide section for Skull on how to deal with um, adventurers one-on-one -on -one and the 2v1 fight and the 3v1 fight which are in the part 2 and 3 guides of my Skull Guide series. Once again, uh, the, the, they got, they're dying pretty fast. The build is pretty strong right now. I'm I'm kind of surprised we're not really using the dragon and they are dying pretty quickly. I mean, what can I say? I guess we're just doing really well right now. Gravedigger, Ogre, and Justice Served. I'm not really keen on the Justice Serve right now. Ogre, once again, we got a really good contestant. That's why getting something nice early on like the dragon it's saving us having to keep an eye out for better ones until we find something that's just truly good for us, right? However, Gravedigger is here. I don't want him. I can destroy him, take his bone fragments, move into Arachne, and we now have at least more than 30. I can upgrade to Unique. Little Werewolf is going to upgrade. Da 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 da. I think I just remembered that my last time I did one of these runs. I don't know why, but more often than not, whenever I do runs where I'm explaining myself in a very overly thorough way for like newer players, a lot of the time it's Werewolf. I wonder why Werewolf is the is the guy that I'm I'm talking about so much. Now, Werewolf is upgraded to Unique. Always look at your Skull's descriptions for all of their uh, passive, swap, and abilities when upgrading them because they do improve. So as you'll see, in addition to all of the stuff that was there before when he was rare, he now has a new sentence. Increase critical rate by up to 30% in proportion to distance moved. That plays into his new little bar. A lot of Skulls in this game, as they upgrade, they gain Unique mechanics. So... The more you move, that little gray bar down there starts to fill. That is telling us how much crit we have. I will say right now, dashing is the best thing to build this bar. You can just dash around a bunch and that bar fills up. So this is our bar. At maximum, we have an extra 30% crit rate. We see our crit rate down here is at 55%. Look at your character stat info sheet if you want to see what kind of difference is being made. And then if I stand still and let that go down a little bit, and I come back in, 47%. Wow, look at that. And then I come out and I let it go down a little bit more. 39%. So you can see we are getting a bonus by moving around a lot and always be moving. Now, for newer players, it's a lot of fun to zip around and do all this kind of stuff. But do be careful. It is more worth your while to lose some of your buff than it is to rush headlong into a big attack and lose, you know, a solid eighth of your life because, you know, you dove into a big dude's hammer swing because you were too, too keen to keep your bar filled up. In addition to that, our swap has been changed. When swapping, we now charge while inv invincible, deal damage, and create lacerating gusts, dealing magic damage. Swap synergy is entirely up to you as to whether or not you want to do a lot of swapping or not. You can play the game with just one dominant skull, which is what I'm doing right now, just to show you guys from a beginner's perspective what you can do. However, it is worth your while to find a secondary skull that is decent. You don't need to prioritize it. You can, say, for example, upgrade each of your skulls in unison. So I'm going to play, like, hypothetically, I have Werewolf and Sword. I want to get my Werewolf to rare, then my Sword to rare, then my Werewolf to unique, then my Sword to unique. You can do that and alternate them and keep them both at relatively the same power. Or you could have a Legendary Werewolf and just a Rare Sword, you know? Just having a second boy to swap off onto and use their abilities is often very handy. Because what a lot of players will do is use your main skull, use all the abilities, use all the stuff they have at their disposal, and now you've got cooldowns. During those cooldown wait periods, swap out to a new dude, do some stuff with them, and then by the time the swap cooldown comes back, you've probably got some abilities to use on your main skull again, right? That's the flow of the game that the game wants you to use um, as you get more used to it. Now, uh, Shield Totem. These guys have Hyper Armor. Hyper Armor means they cannot be staggered by hitting them. <sighs> However, <laughs> this... This accelerating sword is doing a lot for us right now, I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm going to get in here and use my my new power. Use that trap right there. Oh, another trap. And bully these guys. Nice. We obtained a uh, beast sleep when we upgraded. Every skull by the end of the run needs two abilities as you upgrade them. Uh, a lot of these skulls will upgrade to unique and get their seconds if they don't already have them. So a lot of the common skulls only start with one ability and we'll get their second abilities as they, you know, get to unique. I think Rider is one of the only skulls these days that have two abilities at rare. 
Um, but that's part of why I like to upgrade my skulls initially, is to get the second ability. I find that having two different special attacks to do is just better in the long run. Gives you more options. Uh, little hunter boy. I'm going to let him be destroyed because he's worth a lot of fragments to me. I'm going to drop the dragon here. I haven't used the dragon in a hot second. Get it. Hot second. We have humor in this run. Uh, that's it. They're all done. This room is a bit annoying. Alternating fireball traps from up and below. You can predict where they're going to go. The hard part is the enemies that spawn. But if you have a, a stupid strong quintessence, <laughs> you can just cheese through that entire endeavor. Uh, Trainee's necklace, gnome, a lot. This is all magic except for Mage's Meta Bracelet, but it has wisdom on it. It's still mostly a magic themed thing. But because it doesn't specify magic in the main effect, skill cooldown speed being boosted every time six skills are used, our Werewolf's Bee Sleep actually has three charges to it. And each one of those counts as one ability used. So Werewolf could activate man, uh, Mage's Meta Bracelet very, very quickly. And that just feeds into getting more skills, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm going to chase down... Oh, hello, Gunpowder Sword that has arms on it, which is exactly what I want. Gunpowder Sword, word of the wise, at least as of making this video, is still one of the strongest items in the game for a physical build because critical hits make an explosion that does physical damage. As we know, my critical hit chance on Werewolf can be expanded to be very, very high, over 50%. And we also have the disposable syringe for extra synergy. Also, with the pendant and the syringe together, we have tier 2 and now poison inscription. Poison interval ticks have been decreased, so our poison ticks more frequently. So, the real question is, Gunpowder Sword needs to replace an item. Now, because all of our other items are giving us some sort of benefit, the two items that are most likely going to get replaced first are the Kalein Insignia and the Cavalry Decoration. But because the Cavalry Decoration is giving us a damage return, and I only have the one other Carlean item that I'm not going to get rid of, mind you, I may as well ditch the Insignia now. And I'm going to leave it on the ground. That way I don't find it if I were to reroll again. Now we also have the Jagamon Thorn here. Normal attacking against an enemy inflicts a fixed amount of damage, 7 fixed damage, and increases your attack and movement speed. So this also builds into an attack speed boost and bleed boost which synergizes with our Broken Dagger. Amplify bleed damage by 60% if we get two stacks of this. So if I take this now and I can get rid of that Cavalry Decoration, Heirloom and Chase as inscriptions aren't really helping us right now. And while the damage from the dash is okay, you know, 50 and 20 damage is okay, we can literally swing for bigger chunks of damage than simply dashing into an enemy. So pretty handy little replacement right there. And so now we have four in arms, two rapid, two poison, and two bleed. Kind of a unique little build we got going on right now. But it will help. Now, if I were to sell both of these, I'm going to get about four, was it seven? 774 gold. I'd get just over a thousand. I could do another reroll and be greedy, but I'm not going to. Let's move on. And I'm going to take another skull room because we're at 33 fragments. My werewolf isn't unique. I want him to get to legendary. Let's move on. Now, ah, tricky boys. Just kidding, they die immediately. Now these guys up here with the big glowing balls. It's it's the slowest attack in the world. You can just bait it, dash through it, jump over it. They're not difficult. They're just there to be a nuisance. Quite literally, it doesn't really matter what they do. They're like, they're slow and they're dumb, right? Get rid of them. You'll notice that our damage is going to go up by a decent chunk. Thanks to those new items we've acquired. Very, very handy. This dude above us is the healer. All he does is he heals. That's literally it. He heals weakened enemies. So, you know, watch out. <laughs> watch out by leaving him alive. You'll heal your opponents. Not by a lot, but you know, just a little bit. Now the slime. We found the slime NPC. I'm just gonna come up here and, oh, it's a unique pile. Okay. Um, the slime will duplicate any item in your inventory and give you an extra one. He's one of the most powerful NPCs to find in the game. He can duplicate legendary items. He can duplicate anything in your inventory. And it's led a lot of people to focus their runs around what he gives you. So, for example, he's given us another disposable syringe, which I don't think does anything for us because critical hitting already inflicts poison and we can't inflict double poison. So, funny enough, this might literally be the worst thing he could have given us. <laughs> At least everything else has some sort of, you know passive benefit to it uh crits inflicting poison is already its own thing you, there's no way to make that better than it just doing it 
We could take it for three points in poison, and then we just need one more to get to four. But I don't need this. I'm going to leave it behind. It could have given me anything else, but instead he gave me that. Now, this is a unique skull pile. If I open it, we get the Predator, a unique skull. Now, people get very confused about this. I'm going to quickly explain the pile situation and the chest situation. Um, you will always find minimum whatever rarity the skull pile or the chest is. So the tiny little brown chests are common chests and the tiny little skull piles are common piles. However, if you get all the way up, you can get to like legendary and unique skull piles and the, you know, the blue and the red, big red adorn chests give you higher rarity items. And sometimes, very rarely, you will open a little brown chest and get a rarer item than common. Or you might open a rare skull pile and a legendary skull jumps out and you think to yourself wait a minute that made no sense why did it do that right um that's because you can only get the minimum that unique skull pile right there is capable of giving me a unique skull or a legendary it won't go below you can never get ripped off basically um if it's a rare skull pile rare unique legendary if it's a legendary skull pile you will only get legendaries the same for chests if it's a legendary chest there is always a legendary in there. Some people will freeze and, and they'll see a chest spawn here and the chest quickly goes from brown to blue. And they're like, wait, my chest just transformed. What happened? That was the game deciding that we're going to give you at least minimum a rare or higher item, right? So you can never get ripped off, only rewarded more. And that's kind of how you often find legendary items and skulls as early as act one as well. Very, very handy. Man, we are tearing through these guys now. We are literally tearing through, dudes. Um, die, I guess. Yep, okay, cool. <laughs> Just by moving around, our B-Sleep is propelling us forward a lot. So we are getting our maximum critical effect boosted up pretty quickly. Which is sitting at about 55%. Wipe out all these dudes. Jump up here. Bam, bam, bam. I've covered these guys already. I think I've covered all of the main Act 2 enemies that are at least troublesome. <laughs> Die. Which is good because we're at the end of Act 2. Sphinx Eye. This is all magic. I don't care about this. Moving into the Kalean Sisters. And I'm going to explain right now. You are not alone. The Kalean Sisters battle is one of the first major walls in the game, heavily inspired by the Mantis Lords from Hollow Knight. You are not wrong in thinking that as well. Um, this is the fight that, that gets people to stop and really realize, wait, I need to practice. So, that that attack right there, they, they telegraph it, jump, stand still, jump. I'm trying to explain as we go. Um, don't stand in the, in, the, in the yellow lines. Yellow line, don't stand in it. She's jumping, move away. After a few conjoined attacks, one sister will stay in the back. You can see her up on the balcony up there. And the second sister will come down and fight you. You can dash through this. Either run away or dash through it. If you're using a power skull, you might be too slow. Try and dash through it. Everything that she does, you can dash past. They're not that fast. Right? When they're paired up, they're the most dangerous. Jump to avoid that. They will do uh, alternating attacks from above and across from you. Or double from above, double from across. They like to mix things up. When they land, when they come down and land the first time, they will always fire that yellow attack. This is a triple poke. The last one is, is a multiple one. It's going to do the, the, yep. Dash through it. You'll get the timing down eventually on that. Line, avoid the line. I recommend dashing away from that because even if you just walk away, it might be bad timing. I want them to do the triple light beams again. Can you do the triple light beams again? The triple light beams, I like to call it the jump rope attack because the idea is to pretend you're skipping. And you can... They're not going to do it, are they? Shut up and do it. Just shut up and do it. I do recommend for every boss fight in the game, every single boss fight in this game, every regular enemy in the game that's giving you trouble, practice them. Take your time. You don't have to fight them. Stand there and practice. Assess the situation. How am I going to avoid these attacks? What strategy am I going to employ to avoid all these attacks? I'm going to react. Yep. Yep, I'm going to react. I'm going to get good at dodging. One from there, one from there. Okay, good. We're looking good now. You don't have to rush. You don't have to be frantic. You can take your time and be methodical about it. I mean, 
Rich coming from me, who likes to do a lot of, you know, really rushed fights in my regular videos, but if you're learning, take your time. Breathe. Breathe, damn it. Although, having said that, I really would like them to do that. Here we go. Jump. Stand still. Jump. You're, you're skipping rope. You're skipping, dude. It's skipping. You want to bait the first one, and then by jumping the first one, it causes the second set of projectiles to go too high. Jump. Stand. Jump. Or stand. Jump. Stand. Alternate. Now, I think we're finally ready to put an end to phase one of the sisters. In the sisters fight, they each have a life bar. Depending on how low you get the surviving sister, it actually does um, affect how much life the second phase has. So you can do one of two things. You could, I was just not ready for you to do that lady. I'm trying to talk here. You could weaken both sisters down to being very low on life. That way the second phase is always gonna be a lot easier. Or you can rush one of the sisters down and you'll have a longer phase two. Whichever phase you don't like the most, phase one or two, you can you can always have a way of getting through it easier. So for example, if I want to make phase two easier, I can now work on hurting this secondary sister who has the left life bar. And now she'll be low on life. The right sister is almost dead. It doesn't matter which one I kill because now the second one comes down and she only has a little bit of life left. She'll always get a boost to her life Bam, 1600. So because she was already low, you can see her life bar is below half to begin with. So if you like phase one more and you're okay with that, work on phase one longer. Work on both life bars. That way you get a shorter phase two. If you, do, if you like phase two more, burn one sister and you'll have a longer phase two. Now, she does a lot of the same kind of attacks. Jump and double jump through that. Double dodge through that, I should say. Find a gap or dodge through the lines. Phase two is a lot faster. How was I getting hit? Dude, stand between stand between the lightning. Don't do what I do. This regular dive, you can walk beyond it. These waves, you can dodge through them or jump over them. This attack is too slow to catch you if you're moving. I'm going to try and stand, yep, in between the gaps. Do a dodge at the last second if you get nervous. Every time she teleports away, get ready for what she's going to do. I like to watch to see if she's going to come from above. Oh, she got rid of the triple. Be ready to dodge. Yep. Yep. Do a thing. Do a thing. All right, where are we going to stand? Oh, not there. I'm going to... No, I dodged too early. Don't dodge too early. I was going to find a spot to stand. And I couldn't find a spot. I was going to stand still. I want to show you just standing still, and I couldn't do it. All right. Whenever she just disappears like that... She's probably going to do this rush attack. I recommend standing in front of her. Go to where she's going to land. You can stand in front of her and smack her in the face a little bit. It's very good extra damage. All right, here we go. Let's find a spot to stand. Here. Yay! You can just stand between the lines. Or I still like to dodge. Get to the front of her. He's too big. I think Werewolf is just too chunky. <laughs> oh, well. We can get rid of her now and move on through the, the, the fight. Hit it with that B sleep. Get rid of this battle. If you want a more slown down and more in-depth breakdown of each of these boss fights, like to the point where it's, you know, you can really see in slow-mo, frame by frame, what's going on. Uh, my guide series, I'll have part one linked below, like I said, for the adventurer fights. There's part two and three for act two and three. Each of the boss fights are gone over in more detail to make it easier to understand what they're doing and how to deal with them. But I'm going to take each one of these fights a little bit slower in this video, not to like really break down in over depth how to fight them, but to give you a good idea. If you want the real in depth stuff, there's there's extra videos I've done that explain the boss fights in more greater detail. Now, Goldmane Rapier is here. It's a very good item. It has rapidity on it. We get more attack speed. Every third normal attack uh, does golden wound, which does damage to enemies. Very, very good. Don't want this. Medusa is magic. That's more of a dash damage kind of thing with a with a, a power skull. Requires a lot of swapping. Not a bad item, but swaps a lot. Oh look, Thieves Black Steel Dagger, one of the other best items in the entire game. <laughs> and approaching death. Approaching death is not bad here. We actually have very good options between the gold main rapier, which is a boss item, mind you. The boss items are the gold uh gold main rapier and proof of fellowship. You only get these two items from this boss fight. Um, same with Elder Ents Gratitude and the Seed from Yggdrasil. Each boss has up to two items that you can only get from that boss fight. So now's my only chance to get this, but I can get these later. But 
let's be real, the, the Thieves Black Steel Dagger is, is very good. It gives us a crit boost by attacking enemies up to 20 times. So you, you're not reading that wrong. That's a 40% critical boost. And on top of the fact that we are already getting, um, what was it, 55 or so, we'd be getting close to 100% crit chance. Which means Gunpowder Sword is going to activate a lot. Uh, or we could take the Approaching Death, because we are critting a lot and inflicting poison a lot, amplifying damage by 30% on a poisoned enemy is very strong. But for the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to pick up this Thieves Black Steel Dagger, and I think I might ditch the Toxic Pendant. We lose 20% physical damage and one stack of our poison, but the poison is not there to be the dominant damage. The poison has just been there as a supplement to other real damage. I think the bleed is doing really well for us right now. Extra attack speed there, extra attack speed there. This is just a little bit of extra damage and poison. I'm going to ditch the Pendant for the Thieves Black Steel Dagger, and we can move on into Act 3. Uh, congratulations to all of those who have gotten past the sisters. It is one of the first major walls. You are not alone if you are having a hard time with it. Everyone who's ever played this game, I think, has a at least one or two good horror stories to tell you about the sisters. Now, uh, something that I didn't have time to think about in the fight, but I'll mention it now, is with the sisters themselves, they do share uh, two different health bars. You can kill both sisters at the same time when they're both on the screen, right? However, the game will automatically select one of the sisters and revive them with a lot of life back. So it's actually advised, don't do that unless you just want to do it for a good laugh. But there is no inherent benefit. You cannot skip phase two and completely by killing them both together. One will get revived. You have to do phase two. I'm sorry, I know, but you do have to do it. Now, I wanted to take a look at my critical hit chance once I have the, um... I'm not going to get target dummies, am I? You're a meanie. You're a big meanie because I don't have my upgrades. You're a big meanie. I've got my maximum movement speed boost to 55. I'm going to take a skull room because I still haven't got my legendary werewolf. And we're going to bully dudes until our crit is maxed out at 40%. Which is easier said than done, because these guys are dying very, very, very fu- 40, okay. Very fu- wait. Uh, 94% crit hit chance. It's a- I'd lost it the last second there. It's a little bit of damage, right? It's a little bit of damage. Now, <laughs> Act 3, I'm sorry, the first room was a bit of a blur because I was just trying to test some stuff. Act 3 is similar to Act 2 in that you'll find enemies like- Oh, don't kill him. These explosion dudes, the red-faced explosion dudes, they make a noise, they run at you, just run away, dodge at the last second if they get on top of you, so they land on you, yeah, dodge away, avoid the explosion. Anything in this area that pulls up a red exclamation mark is going to explode, and we don't want that. You'll find these alchemist enemies in here now, their only attack is that they throw poison vials at you. Um, it's a very slow-moving attack. However, it is active the whole way it's out, so you can accidentally jump into it. But if you stay on the ground, you know, it, it, it's harder for them to hit you if you stay on the ground, right? These guys are like just a new replacement to a basic enemy. They're not problems whatsoever. These guys are summoners. They come uh, paired. They will try and summon an enemy. Killing one is not enough. You have to kill both to stop them from successfully summoning a golem who... Why are they dying so fast? That ogre just walked... Okay, uh, natural hazard here. These beams do damage to enemies as well. Weird. Uh, these canisters right here can be smashed open and there are enemies inside. I killed the guy inside as I smashed it because we're doing too much damage. Uh, the tree died before I could show anything off. Uh, okay. These quartz corrupted funny looking dudes who are like half naked. They run at you. They swing. They're like regular dudes, but they blow up when they die. Red exclamation mark. Avoid the red exclamation mark. I have to be a little bit better at showing off what we're doing here. Oh, look, it's the Lunar Ring. Remember the Solar Sword I told you about? It's the Lunar Ring. So if I buy the Lunar Ring, doesn't matter where I put it because we're going to end up having these items merge. My sword is gone. My ring is merged with my sword. We have the Fulgent Dawn, which comes with an arm stack. So we didn't lose our arms from the sword. We keep our arms and we gain artifact from the ring. It doesn't matter. 
physical attack and magic boosted by 80%, so the, the damage from our sword got a bit of a buff. Attacking an enemy unleashes the Light of Dawn, dealing damage to nearby enemies. It's basically a really big AoE nuke. On a, what was it? A 50 second internal cooldown? There you go. And I can then pick up my Jagamon Thorn that I dropped when I got the ring in the first place. So no harm, no foul. We have only gained incredible damage. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It's very good damage. This run is, is a really good example of good damage. This is not an average run. I wanted it to be an average run and it's not. Rerolling the shop, we have a few neat items. I could take this for the courage, but I'm not gonna replace um, anything else that I've got here at the moment. With that, even though I could, I'm gonna reroll instead again. I've got the money for it. I've got plenty of cash to do some rerolls. Ah, Master Fighter gives you a big damage boost when you're fighting one or two enemies. The Magic Pocket Watch has a big chunk of skill cooldown speed. Hmm. I could take either one and replace the syringe since poison is no longer something we're really worried about because as you can see enemies are dying faster than they really get time to be poisoned so I can buy this replace the syringe and now we get bigger damage returns the master fighter is a great item to have for adventurer fights the first the second and the last one the third adventurer fight that's ahead of us has three enemies so there's the full effect of master fighters extra 45 percent damage won't activate and it won't activate as much in rooms, but boss fights. Most boss fights are just one, maybe two people, like with the sisters, that's it. Master Fighter is a great boss slaying item to get. I'll take it. Let's move forward. Go into this next skull room and start slaying. The Fulgent Dawn is going to eradicate dudes. These little guys here, the blue ones will jump and shoot spikes. The little yellow ones just lunge at you. They're relatively basic, don't worry about them. Big ogres, the brogers. They do a multiple, by the way, the trees are exactly the same as the trees in the first area. If you get too close to them, they have a spike attack that will try and poke you. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, I recommend, you can even hit them from a distance. Kill them, they blow up. Don't get blown up with them. Thank you for knocking him into me, Mr. Tree. Now, I, I'm, he's gonna die. He's gonna die to the sword. <laughs> Now, Ogres, they do a triple slam. One, two, and they do turn around on the third. All you have to do is run past them for the one, two, and then avoid the third. If there's more than one Ogre, sometimes it gets confusing because they will swing all over the place. Basically, wait for them to finish doing their three hits and don't have them get pushed into you by other spell effects and then avoid that final third one. You can walk past, so run past him. One, two, and then dodge past for the third. The third one, he will always change directions. Now, these little vials here that have spirits inside of them, which always like to die when I hit them now because we're too strong. Those little spirits, in addition to these that have the dudes inside, are also not considered mandatory enemies. These enemies, like the uh, little maid ladies in Act 2, you can just skip them. Didn't even see you were swinging, dude. I want to show off the, uh, the big golem. Now the summoners, if you don't kill the summoners in time, they will summon a golem. I'm sure you've probably seen one or two golems by now in your own playthroughs if you've been up to Act 3. The golems, if you're at a distance, they will always fire distance attacks. They've got a mouth cannon. He'll also spawn an exploding crystal underneath you. You do not have to fight this guy. Notice how it says zero enemies. Like the maids, you can walk over here, get your loot and leave the room. However, you can fight them if you really, really, really want to. The charge is something they always do when they spawn. It's the first thing they do. I suggest bait the charge, wait for an attack, and then bully them after that. And then after about 10 seconds or so, run away and wait for the next charge. Because that running, charging thing that they do is where a lot of their damage comes from. And getting, getting hit by that is uh, not fun in the least. But killing them is only really something you need to do if you're interested in getting some extra money and quartz. That's about it. I don't advise doing it. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, we are, we are kind of destroying rooms right now. I'm not going to lie. The damage on this has, has gotten out of control. Explodey dude. Dodge out the way. Yay. Uh, basic guys. Kill them. Doesn't really matter. We don't need that. <laughs> We're way beyond needing that. Third adventurer fight. There's now three adventurers. Wow. 
The same advice for each adventurer stays true, except now you have to worry about avoiding even more attacks from them. I recommend picking out the weak link, whoever the one that stands still the most is, or the weakest one, and bully that one first, and then just, wow, pick them apart. And, I mean, I've got my guide videos on how the adventurers work. If you get dumb damage, you can do this, but I advise taking your time. Pick the one that moves the least. In this case, she floats, he teleports. She stands still the most. That's why I went after her first, because I can get her in the corner and pick on her. Sometimes, depending on the situation, these three enemies like to fire a lot of projectiles. You've got shurikens, fireballs, arrows. Sometimes the best approach is to go in and trade a little bit of life because you're going to get life orbs back anyway and try and get one out of the way. Divide and conquer. Dealing with two enemies, way easier than dealing with three. But if it's a bit of a more slow-paced fight, say the big paladin guy with a shield, the healing girl, you can take your time a little bit more and be more methodical because you need to kill the healing girl in that situation. The one piece of advice I'll give you about adventurers right now is that if the healing priestess girl is ever there, make her your priority. Not only does she heal her team, she also buffs them to take less damage, and she's just really annoying in general with her ultimate big heal, so just get rid of her ASAP. I'm at a point where I still need fragments for legendary, so I should still destroy Jean. I don't need the golem, I've got my dragon already, and fighter's belt isn't necessary, so let's just destroy the genie. Get those 11 fragments. I can't talk to Arachne yet, I don't have my 100. Taking a skull room, please! Give me what I need. There's no need to do this. I'm just breaking them because I know they're going to come out anyway. You can kill these ghosts prior to uh, them coming after you. Fun fact, all of the little spirits in the bottles do count towards kill counts. So for items like the Forbidden Sword that wants you to kill 300 enemies in order to activate it. Same with the uh, Dwarf um, Quintessence that requires 300 shots to land from the actual bullets. They all count towards that effect, so going after these guys is sometimes beneficial. Ogre. Slams. Go back behind him. Slams. Go back behind him. Alright. A lot of these enemies are left-right enemies. Rockstar! Hallelujah! I know that for 23 fragments we now have more than 100. I'm going to start taking item rooms. I have my, my legendary werewolf set in stone. I don't think I really need to worry about... Wow! Fulgen Dawn just killed all the guys upstairs for me. So normally you kill the tree, you kill the dudes, and there's, there's alchemists up here that are indeed dead. So this room finished itself. He just... That was a big alchemist. I was going to tell you about the big alchemist. God, it's fine. It's fine. We are... We are we are failing to succeed and succeeding at failing. Okay. In the shop, I don't want any of this. Reroll. Great magic item. Not for us. A lot of these items, not quite for us. Hidden Blade is a cool uh, inscription. We don't need it, though, because we're kind of full on other stuff. It's, it's really hard. What would I get rid of? I could get rid of the bleed. I could get rid of my, my broken dagger at some point. Or get rid of the Jagamon Thorn in order to... Uh, compound a bit more on Hidden Blade, but I think I want to go a bit more in the big raw damage department. So I'm going to re-roll just a little bit here. No, nothing I want. Okay, and so rather than re-roll again and lose more money, I'm going to cut my losses short and move on. And I don't need any more skulls because my werewolf will become legendary. If I was playing dominantly with two skulls that I was alternating back and forth, and don't worry, you can see a lot of examples of me doing that throughout the rest of my channel. You know, I play around a lot of different skulls. You can find a video for every skull in the game on my channel, how I like to play them, multiple examples of which. However, I'm dominantly using Werewolf here and I don't need to worry about getting more fragments. So a regular money room, let's go do it. I'm gonna kill both summoner guys so that, <laughs> so that the uh, <laughs> summon guy doesn't come out. Right, big alchemist. Big Alchemist only does one thing. He throws vials that then have spirits in them. Um, he does two, actually. I'm lying. He does two. He summons the vials, and he also summons a golem. Now, the golem ball will explode after a bit of distance and then fan out. You only have to worry about the ball when it's coming and then going. And the red spirits, to be fair. Red spirits are annoying. 
Oh, this golem, he's gonna shoot straight ahead. I dodge through it. Ignore every other ball. You only have to dodge one ball. It doesn't matter. The fact that, the fact that it fans out is redundant. And he's dead. <laughs> That's it. Big alchemist dudes are not the end of the world. They are just there to throw potions at you and pretend that they're doing good work when they're not. Big Broger. Summon guys. Uh, Big Alchemist. Which one are you? Oh, he summons a lot. So some of them will sometimes throw vials that summon more than one ghost. And he also has the golem that smacks the ground and does a lot of damage in an area nearby. So with the golem that smacks the ground, it always appears like behind you. So either dodge back behind yourself or just dodge forward. Dodging in general is just a good idea. 90% of the time, you can avoid these attacks. Come up here. A new one spawns. We're going to kill him before he can do anything because, you know, forget that guy, am I right? Blood drinking sword. We have a chance to obtain more arms and more bleed. And more damage, potentially. Reaching the maximum limit for this effect increases crit rate by 20%. I don't think I can physically get 50 bleed procs to, to meet the criteria for this item. But extra arms isn't bad, and I think it's better than taking Broken Dagger right now. So I'm going to replace... Should I? Should I? I think I might. I'm going to replace the Broken Dagger, which also has bleed on it, with the Blood Drinking Sword. It doesn't mean that I lose any bleed. I stay the same on my bleed. I'm gaining one extra arms, so if I find one more arms item might ditch the Jagamon Thorn, which is the only item that I have that doesn't really have big damage returns and big arms on it. And that way I get six arms, you know, planning for the future. Cheese strategy. See that? Some skulls can make this jump. Like I said in the beginning of the run, there are some ways to get towards the end of an area without having to do them. If I come down below and I kill those three enemies down there in this little section in here, I can skip going underneath and dealing with all these guys. But I'm going to come down here anyway, because why not? Sometimes doing the full uh, clear is worth your while for money and fragments. Uh, quartz, rather. Which is very handy in the long run. But if you're like me and you're not wanting to spend too much time in a room, skipping is sometimes a good idea. Now the Chimera. First and foremost, part three of Guide series. Far more in-depth breakdown on the Chimera, because this Chimera fight is going to be a bit of weird. Because talking about him and doing him at the same time is hard. The Chimera... Always starts the fight by summoning adds. You can choose to do two things. You can ignore the adds, because the Chimera can and will most likely kill these adds herself, because her own attacks damage them. For example... Trying to see... There, that little one guy there. He's getting bullied by that attack. These enemies also have less life than the regular ones that you'll find in Act 3, so they die a bit sooner. Poison, poison everywhere. I recommend standing just below the chin under here for Chimera. That way, more often than not, you can avoid the stompy stompies because Chimera does like to stamp her feet a lot and get very grumpy. If you stand too close, the stomp will hit you. If you stand about here, the stomp will miss you. Aim for the chin. And also avoid all the poison all over the screen. Three poisons, it splashes on the ground, so I recommend jumping and dashing up through that first one towards her. Smack her in the chin. Is that more enemies getting summoned? I might use my Quintessence to control those enemies for me. There we go. Also getting some burn on the Chimera. When she reaches half life, which she's about to get to right now. Also the poison from the ceiling. Don't stand in the red. Move away. Poison balls. Smack, 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 smack. She's now below half life. She's going to transition to phase two. Red everywhere. Go towards her. Stay close to her and dodge through the poison beam and then dodge into her to avoid that slam. It is the best way to be close to her, avoid all the adds, and do some extra damage at the same time. You can dodge through all the poison attacks. They are considered projectiles. You are immune to it. You can even dodge through these big poison walls if you need to because sometimes they do get so close together that you can't stand in between them. and try and stay close to her if you can. Now, you're gonna jump back for me again? Good. Last time to see this. Get away from that, stay close to her. Poison wall. Dive through the poison wall. Dash, dash, dash. And dash, dash, dash. There you go. You can stay close to her, which means you can still hit her instead of going all the way to the back and dealing with that attack the slow way. 
Time to say goodbye to the Chimera. We didn't get to see the bite. She does a big lunging bite attack, which she will often do when you're far away from her. That's why staying close to her chin tricks her into not ever doing it. And if you stay too close to her, the three big stomp is where she goes bam, 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 and she tries to step on you. Once again, staying by her chin, shouldn't get hit by that at all. Items. And finally, as I said before I came in, go check out part three of my guide series for a more in-depth breakdown on that Chimera fight. But ultimately, you can deal with that fight just by avoiding... Uh, a couple of attacks, and then validating the rest. It's a lot easier that way. The Chimera is one of those bosses where I've heard a lot of people say they either think the sisters are harder, or that Chimera is way harder. It's kind of like one or the other. You're either someone who has a hard time on the sisters and an easy time on Chimera, or vice versa. And it's kind of funny to hear that, but I, I, I think it's cute. I like that that is like the case for some people. Now, Pot of Greed is a very, very good damaging item. It uh, gives you more damage based on how many legendary any things you have if you have legendary skulls quintessences or items if you manage to get a lot of them you get a stacking damage effect up to 120 percent also reaching four legendaries which is the maximum effect it will grant you one free legendary item so pot of greed counts itself as one so if i were to take this pot of greed is one item we have the fulgent dawn as our second legendary i would need two more in order to obtain um the effect from pot of greed and get the extra item However, Alpha Werewolf is about to be upgraded to Legendary at Arachne. I know that. So I actually do have access to three Legendaries, which for Pot of Greed is 90% more damage. I'm then one shy of getting a free Legendary item and, you know, the maximum effect. So 90% damage versus all of this other stuff here is pretty hard to pass up on. I'm going to ditch the Jagamon Thorn like I said I probably would. Bam, there we go. And we have access to a big chunk of damage with Pot of Greed. I just need to come down here, upgrade my Werewolf. You can see down the bottom, that little number two right there is telling us that Pot of Greed is at two stacks. It's also telling us that our Bleeding Sword is on 11 stacks, which I've said before, I don't think we're going to get that to 50 to, um, to evolve it. So it's mostly just there as an arms item, but I might replace it with something else if I find something better, because it really isn't doing that much for us at this, at this point in time. But upgrading the Werewolf. Max you out. Da 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 da. Legendary werewolf. I'm gonna take a second and get a sip of drink because I've been running my mouth for I don't even know how long now. It's been well over an hour. Yeah, it feels it's well over an hour long. I apologize for how long this is. But it is one of those those kind of runs, you know. I'm actually amazed at how strong this is. It's a very strong werewolf run. Now moving into act four, the hardest act in the game. I don't care who you are. This is the hardest act in the game. You know, act two and three, nothing, nothing. Now, because we finished upgrading our werewolf, I could, I could, and this is very, very, you know, very, very logistical. I could take more skull rooms, find a second skull that I like. You have a higher chance, like I said, to get uniques and legendaries in act three and four. I could find like ninja, samurai, berserker. I could find a good physical damaging guy to partner with my werewolf. Um, but if I don't, you know, I'm kind of just going into skull rooms and, and looking for a guy. And if I don't find them, I don't really want to upgrade Thief because he's mostly magical and he doesn't synergize with all my items. So what I could also do is take item and money rooms and try and get those last replacements for Blood Drinking Sword and get that last legendary for Pot of Greed. I'm going to do that instead. But you can go after skull rooms if you want. There is no harm in that. Now, basic little dudes, they run at you. They swing at you. They're annoying. If they hit you, they leave a debuff. You can see that little that little yellow cross, that projectile's gonna hit me. Oh no, I'm on two stacks of this debuff. What is this debuff right now? That debuff makes you take extra damage. The more it stacks up on you, the more damage you take. These little candle tossing dudes, by the way, are really annoying. She's gonna turn them all into tentacles. Those candles that they throw, the fiery thingies. Um, they aim at you based on where you are when they throw. So if you're in the air, they do throw up. They don't just throw straight ahead. They will aim towards you. So avoiding these guys will come down to dodging as they throw and not before they throw. It's one of those little mix-ups that you've got to worry about. Now, these ladies here may as well be the Act 4 equivalent of the maid ladies from Act 2 because they summon enemies. She will also get bored of them after a while and transform them into tentacles, which are way easier to deal with than real enemies. Bell ringers will summon extra enemies. Some of them are explosive dudes. These guys will run at you and blow up kamikaze style. 
best way to deal with them is as you saw right there jump up dash over them stay airborne don't touch the ground the ground is lava if you do touch the ground i recommend touch and dash immediately these little dudes once they see you and have you in their sights they will run at you and they will go after you now tentacles i said that the ladies will sometimes turn them into tentacles these are also unnecessary things to kill you don't have to kill them they're not necessary to get through the nice gold count by the way look at that they're not necessary to get through the room but they do count towards things like Kyrian and Dwarf. So if you have an item or a condition where, say, for example, you have to kill 300 enemies or bleed this many enemies or do this or do that, you can use those as fodder. But if you don't have one of those, don't worry about it. Don't deal with them. You don't need to. Summoners. If you kill these guys before they finish summoning, you can stop them from summoning. However, crowd control effects like stunning and freezing, etc. will only instantly summon enemies it's a really weird thing and i feel like it shouldn't work that way but it does if they're ringing the bell and you walk up and you freeze them or you stun them rather than stop the effect the enemies just instantly spawn you have now skipped the animation and they are there immediately i don't agree with this and i don't know if it's a bug or not but try not to stun them unless you just want to get it over and done with earlier but the bell ringer dudes do die soon after they summon enemies and the enemies that they do summon also try and kill themselves more often than not. So they're more or less a temporary hindrance than a real issue to deal with. Uh, coming in through here, more regular enemies. And I believe it's another summoner lady up here. Who is going to summon more dudes? Smack the candle dude before he can do anything. He does not have hyper armor. He does not care. Kill him. Oh, look. More enemies. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to be sleep. Uh, this little NPC right here is the Halfling Girl. Let me get rid of this guy. Die. Halfling Girl will give you an item to heal you. As her way of thanking you for rescuing her. Thank you, little Halfling Girl. How are you? Wonderful. She can give you anything ranging from like a 15% heal up to a 100% heal. It is random what she gives you. I don't have much need of healing but i will take it anyway because she's nice and i like her now fun little bit of advice for you early on in the game if you find an npc in say act one or two like the halfling girl the slime anything like that if you don't want what their services offer say for example you're in act two you find the halfling girl you're on full life you're confident you don't need healing what a waste you can still free them from the from the cage but don't talk to them there is i'm not gonna say a guaranteed chance but there is, you know, there is still a decent chance that you will see them in Act 3 and 4 by not taking them in earlier acts. So they can come back, and who knows? Back in Act 3 and 4, maybe you've lost more life. Maybe you now genuinely need to find them. Look at these guys being annoying. So the best way to deal with this... Oh no, Fulge and Dawn. Best way to deal with this is to jump up, bait them, and then jump back down again. It's all baiting. Those guys are all baiting. The statues... The statues can't be like CC'd, stunned, or dealt with. They are just a passive thing that sits there. They pulse this AoE. That pulsing AoE is going to apply the negative status effect to me. That little number one down there. Oh no. We are going to be taking more damage from enemy attacks. The way that you cleanse that are with the cleansing fountains in the area. We'll get to those when I get to the next one. Now, sword boys. The sword boys in Act 4 uh not as bad as you think they are but they can be annoying and i mean the big sword guy not these little dudes these little dudes suck now i'm trying to get rid of that little guy he does a sword bump you can see big guy he'll do a bump with his sword if he bumps you away it doesn't really do anything the bump is more so just something to scare you he's gonna die isn't he you can actually just walk away from that or dash through it it doesn't really matter that attack right there that big one right there that's the one to watch out for when he slides back, you know he's doing a big move. Either dodge away or time it and then dodge through it. But at the moment, see, it's going to hit you badly if you get stuck with that. It's going to hit you nastily. I tried to avoid the fireball from the sky and he took advantage of that. What a smart guy. But you want to avoid that back step and slash. Archer guys. What he did just there, that's the equivalent of him backstepping in Act 2. They're all like Act 2 enemies. They do similar things. Except now he has a Sky Rain attack where he shoots up in the air. If I get close to him, he jumps back and shoots. 
except instead of just jumping back on the ground, he jumps back and goes airborne and shoots three shots. He's honestly not much of an issue if you can isolate him or only have to fight him without a whole bunch of other big dudes around him. Last dude to worry about of the regular enemies, Spear Guy. And Spear Guy is without a doubt the worst of the three new upgraded regular knights. He pokes forward with his lance, similar to the Spear Guys in Act 2. He has this really big javelin toss type ability, which he will, uh, you can hear the sound of it starting up by that little, that little ping sound that happens when he does it. The best way to avoid that is to jump back and dash away after about two seconds of timing. This poke, you can dodge through it or jump up and go over it, same as the Spear Guys in Act 2. That little swing that he does afterwards right there, he doesn't always do that, but I tell you, as my advice, always assume that he's going to do it. Just always assume. Because that swing can catch you if you're trying to punish him. So for example, I dodge away, and then if I try and run up and hit him too quickly, like say, wait, oh, oh no, look at that. I jumped up and tried to avoid the poke, and he didn't do it right there, see? I'm gonna punish him. Oh no, I got hit. Hit the throw. One, two, dodge away. One, two, dodge, well, uh, towards. One, two, dodge towards, you should probably do. Moving towards a projectile, with the projectile coming towards you and you dodging towards it, there's a higher likelihood that you'll pass through it with your iframes. Then if you dodge away, you might land in it. Which is very, very silly and not very good. Golden Sword. Hmm. I think the Golden Sword is exactly what I need in order to replace my Blood Drinking Sword. Plus I get two in Treasure, which is a pretty fun little inscription that gives you extra loot in rooms. Thanks to a Pot of Greed and the Golden Sword. Very nice. I'll take that. I'll take that. Now, shop time. Don't be afraid to buy food. Don't be afraid to buy food. If you're low on life, buy the food. It's far more worth your while to get further in the run, get more quartz, get more experience, and, and lose a bit of money to do that than anything else. Um, also, I'm not going to lie, this helps out my golden sword case because I need to spend money to get the damage boost on this. Bam! Buy food. Golden sword is now at 15 out of 70. That's very good for us. Jump down here. Take a look at what's on offer. Giant's axe. Well, I think that's going to be our last uh, arms item that we need, right? So I could get rid of the Master Fighter for this. Master Fighter in a boss fight in a prime situation is a 70% damage boost. This is only 40%, but what this does do is give us that last arms inscription. This is an example of a time where I am more willing to get rid of a slightly stronger item for the benefits of a good inscription upgrade, because that inscription upgrade is going to come back and do more than 30% will. However, if I do find a, an item worth swapping, I can get rid of, say, this, which doesn't have raw stats on it, it's just a good effect. I can get rid of that for something with better arms on it, but it's probably pretty rare. I think the next best arms thing is the Hope Slasher, which is a legendary sword. Rear Blast is also very good, but I can't take that right now. I'm getting low on funds. No, a lot of this is magic. In fact, all of that's magic for the most part. My, my sword is getting powered up, though, so I'm going to keep spending a bit of money here. And my sword is now at 66% damage boost. I'm trying to sell this. There we go. I could also roll again. Get that damage up to max. I would recommend not doing that. So I'm not going to do it because I don't want to give you guys ideas about bad behavior. <laughs> like spending money for 4% more damage. Alright, moving forward. I think there's another summoner lady. Break the totem so you guys don't get any buffs. Kill the lady. And oh look, our treasure has rewarded us with a little chest. Pop it open and you get some money. Yay! If you get a four stack in treasure, you can get items, bone fragments, good stuff. Aha! Finally, we have found this guy. He summons balls. If there's two of them on the screen, they become annoying, so I'm going to get rid of one. I recommend killing one at all times ASAP. Now, this guy... He summons balls. You can jump up and dodge into them. When he summons the many, many, many balls, I recommend going in a small circle and eccentric circles. Serpentine. Serpentine. You can avoid these balls. They do home in on you. They are very annoying. You can also dodge into them to automatically despawn them and get rid of them. They are very annoying to deal with. And of course, Fulgent Dawn gets rid of that guy before he could do his last attack. The big fanning out ball attack that he does. The same with the golems in Act 2. No, Act 3. 
you don't have to worry about all the other balls. Like, think about it. If you're in one spot and there's like 50 b balls that go in a big circle around you, how many of those balls are going to hit you realistically? One. One's going to hit you. So avoid that one ball and the other 49, don't worry about it. Explodey dudes, bait them. Bait them into running at you and then avoid them. Bring out this item, don't care. Take another item room. Kill little dudes. Assassins! The upgraded assassins from Act 1. These guys dominantly stay on the ground. You can mostly avoid them when they teleport away. If he teleports, hit in the air. Punish him. Alright? Get in the air and he'll most likely spawn on the ground. He can spawn in the air and do a drop down attack. But as long as you're in the air and dodging left and right, if you've got like vertical and horizontal movement going by doing this, you'll most likely avoid what he's trying to do. And then after he's finished doing his attack, you've got like two seconds to quickly get in there, smack him with an ability, hit him with something strong, do as much damage, try and kill him. The enemies with little golden coins hovering above their heads is the treasure inscription. It's telling you that these guys will drop a chest. Kamikaze dudes. I don't think I can... Oh no, he died before he could summon dudes. So those guys uh, weren't able to finish... Well, one wasn't able to finish summon. Uh, lady die. This NPC right here, the picture frame looking dude, he will give you an item if you pay him some money. It is random. And he does charge more gold the further in the run you are. In the beginning, in Act 1, it's like 100 gold. Now it's like 610. So he may or may not give you something worth the while. So... Bonus Swiftness is not a bad item. It's actually pretty good in general for our kind of a build. But I'm not going to keep it, just to tell you that we lost, like, 48 gold here, technically, because of the bad trade. Like, you know? But that's not the end of the world, right? We can just leave that behind. It's fine. Sometimes he gives you amazing things, though. Um, there's a skull equivalent to that NPC. It's an old man skeleton sitting in a bed. He will give you... Oh! I heard the sound. Did you hear the sound? I heard the sound. He's going to poke at me. Always assume that he's going to do the swing afterwards. Now, sword dude, do I get another chance to show you off? That one-two swing is, is nothing. We don't care. He actually pushes you away. The shield bump doesn't hurt you. Nah, we're not going to get a chance. He's going to die before he does it. I'm waiting for him to do the big slash. Statues! Statues just try and stomp on you. They're very slow. They're very easy. Avoid the stomp. Hit him afterwards. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> when there's little enemies nearby... You don't have to worry about the statues as much because focus on the enemies. As long as you're not standing still, it's fine. There's the gold coin guy. He's going to drop a chest. Yay, lovely. Slash, slash. Swing, swing. Give me my loot. Kill that tentacle. And down here... Aha. Uh -huh, the worst type of statue. <gasps> if it plays some Mario, you know how booze work? Exactly how booze work. When you face away, they creep up on you and they lunge at you. You face them, they pretend that they're not there. Oh. Assassins who don't know that I know that they're there. <laughs> and yes, you can just kill them by facing them. It's worse if you're stuck in between them. Try and get to one side and then look at all of them at the same time. Much easier to do things that way. Now, fourth adventurer fight. We go back to a 1v1 with a regular adventurer, except they're not regular. They're powered up now. Priest Lady is descending from up above. She's mad. Now, these are adventurer fights on steroids. That's one, but they're a lot stronger than they used to be. They're going to do a lot more to you. Um, she does all the same stuff she did originally, but now extra stuff. So she's going to summon that little ball there. That's going to have a beam effect. If I touch that beam, I get owies. If I fall in that puddle right there, I get owies. She puts a lot of effects on the screen. Her play style is, I'm going to cover the screen in, in ouchy nasties, like this, <laughs> and make you have to have a hard time getting around. That ball in the sky shoots a laser at you. She's healing. Stop her. Whenever she tries to heal, simply smacking her will stop her from doing it. She teleports. You're too slow. And she's now trying to hit me with these, these grounded attacks that she does from back playing the game in earlier acts. There's her ultimate heal move. She summoned a wall. She has summoned a wall. And now she's trying to put a light there. Sometimes she can get really good at boxing you in. Bully her. Dodge through all the light beams. Oh no, beams from the sky. I'm going to smack her a little bit and then run away. And now she's hiding. Look at that. Look at that placement right there. Wow, lady. 
That's a really good placement for you, isn't it? Okay, the light went away. Smack her a bit. I think she's going to do her ultimate soon, right? Take pity on me. Please. Do the ultimate. Do the ultimate. Are you not going to do it? If you've got an attack that likes to move you at the same time, like my Beast Sleep. There we go, ultimate. So this one's a bit funny. She's going to summon these circular sphere things that then fire lasers in an omnidirectional pattern. The best way to deal with it is to bait them into the far corner, and then the middle, and then the far corner, and then jump and dodge and stay in between the lines. I will be the first one to admit, it is sometimes not easy to do that because sometimes she is doing that attack and you're on like a power skull who's slow, or you're just in the middle of dodging something else. Most of the ultimates from these adventurers have a decent chance at hitting you. You can't always avoid all the damage. You're trying to minimize and mitigate damage. I think we got away with dodging most of it there, though. It's pretty good. Uh, Arc Demon, Dark Paladin. Arc Demon's pretty good for magic builds. Not good for us, though. I want to destroy that beat for a bit of extra gold. I am at maximum 70% power on my gold sword, though. So I don't have to worry as much about that right now. Everything else here is looking pretty good. I think we're more or less done. The only thing I can worry about is finding either a legendary quintessence to get my pot of greed to max out, find a better legendary item, like the Hope Slasher to replace this acceleration sword, or I could take a skull room and try and find a legendary skull to also get my four out of four for pot of greed. But the name is true. I'm going to be greedy and I'm going to move on and we're going to get the also um, completely random quintessence sneaky sneaky stealthy room. I can't believe how much they're trying to give me in this run. Oh look, it's Balrog, a legendary quintessence. <laughs> this run will never end. So talk to the mysterious boy. And the mysterious boy will open up the floor for you and allow you to move in to this stealth section uh, Metal Gear style thing. And you, what you need to do is, is destroy all of these little uh, mechanisms. The first one is always right here. It shows you what you need to do. And then you move down and there's a maze-like area and you have these dudes with flashlights. And what you've got to do is sneak around and destroy all the things and not get seen. What happens if you get seen? Well, these guys come after you. That's what happens. And these guys do a lot of damage. They only have a regular swing, but they do a lot. Of... Let, let one hit me for a second. Well, seven damage right now may not seem like a lot. But in Act 1 and 2, if you find these guys, they can do, like, a lot of damage to you. I'm just, I'm just saying. Sometimes this damage can get out of hand. Now, we also have little Heidi crates here. We can get inside and avoid being seen. That's why they're here. So you don't have to be seen. They are also immune to damage until they engage you in combat. So if I were to jump down here and try to uh, hit him, does nothing. He saw me. <laughs> if they see you, it's too late. If they see you, it's too late. Don't worry about it. Now, if, if they get away from you, they will teleport. They will teleport to you. That's how they can become overwhelming really quickly. Nice swing, buddy. Die. And they will go straight to you. And if you get more than one, it can become a problem very quickly. There are treasure chests hidden all around this area. In addition to the mechanisms you have to destroy, you can find fragments. I think they took away quartz that you could find in here as well. And you can also get money here as well. Wait for that guy to go past. Drop down. Wait, I bet that spot down below. You can see on the minimap, the minimap down here, all the green are the mechanisms you have to destroy. All the red, obviously the bad guys walking around trying to find you. There is a mechanism, uh, sorry, a chest. 100 gold, little, little gem in there. You can get all sorts of different items that will sell for different amounts. You can make a lot of money in these special rooms. <laughs> My acceleration sword hit him. He's like, what was that, dude? What was that? What I can do is be very cheeky. I'm going to wait for him to walk past. Drop down. His friend there is going to be a pain, isn't he? Oh, see the spacing on that. And we've got a free chest up here. With, ah, gold bars. Worth 200 gold. Let's go. Now, if they do see you, it doesn't matter. If you can destroy the last one in time. Ugh. All the guys get eradicated all at once. However, all the loot that you have not taken also disappears. So it's not a matter of race through and open, uh, destroy all the mechanisms and then open all the chests afterwards. You need to open the chests while they're there. And then once you've destroyed them all, you get flashbanged for your trouble and can then leave. And he will give you the quintessence as a reward. 
I'm going to take it not to use it. Get one more look at uh, Dragon before we go. But mostly because... Aha! There we go. By replacing... Out of the way. Keep seeing Flame Dragon. Stop. Thank you. We have been given the main of the Beast King, which is a dashing-based item. It is a legendary, but it is not one that benefits our build whatsoever. So sadly, we're not going to get to keep it, but... The real benefit is now that we have Balrog on our side as a legendary quintessence, we have one legendary, two legendary, three legendary, four legendary. Pot of Greed is now maxed out at 120% bonus damage. So I can now leave. Forget about the main of the Beast King. It will be destroyed automatically. Quintessences don't give you anything when they're destroyed, so it doesn't really matter. They'll just get broken one way or another. And we can move on, get our money from the main, and we're here. Now, I'll show you real quick. Balrog is really cool. It is the only, well, one of only three, I think, quintessences that transform you in the game. But this one's more meaningful because it transforms you into a cool Balrog demon. This is why it's a legendary quintessence because you get to do really cool stuff. I have a video on my channel where I was able to get a lot of cooldown reduction stuff for my quintessences and I transformed into a Balrog and was able to play the entire run, basically, as Balrog form. He gets his own uh, stat sheet. He gets his own description with his ability, Cataclysm. Very, very fun. Very, very fun indeed. But I'm going to try and not confuse you by introducing advanced quintessence shenanigans at the same time. I won't use him too much. Buy some food. We got smacked a bit back in that special room. Oh, <laughs> look at Swanesio. <laughs> it's Swanee. I feel like Swanee showing up right now is, is kind of just her wanting to be injected into the video. Swanee is a very special uh, quintessence. Um... She does damage based on whatever's higher between physical and magical and always does a big double explosion. It does a lot of damage. And it's just in general a very, very good quintessence for burst damage situations. It's uh, a quintessence that I have emotes on my Twitch for. A lot of like cool nonsense. People get really up it's like they get hype when Swanee shows up because Swanee is always just such a, a powerhouse. She's like a carry in her own regard. Um, I'm not finding that last arms item that I want. We do find another Master Fighter, though. But I guess we're just going to move on and leave it as it is, and then approach towards the end of the run. Another special room here. Ah, shielded enemies, right. So this little guy here has his little bubble on him. We can't hurt him. We are stuck in one of the most annoying rooms in the entire area. That little dude is but one common little nuisance but he is protected by an invincibility barrier whatever shall we do well the way to get through that is to destroy that but we can't get to that not until we've destroyed all of the regular statue enemies swanee deal with this i'm gonna wiggle back and forth if you wiggle you can make them dance and stop them from ever doing anything now i can destroy this you are vulnerable, little dude. Die. Die, die. Die, die, die. Give me the gold. Moving through. We are making progress. Another big nuisance room. This big guy's got four of them on him. Four of them. I bet I can get in and destroy them if I kill all the little dudes. Oh, look. A gate opened up. Now, big man here. Good chance to show you what he does. He's another example of the big shoulder charging dudes from Act 2 and 3. He has slams. His slam is always in one direction. He has a tackle. That slam, you see the lightning in the sky when he does the slam? It hits that high. Jumping up and going over is not always a great idea with that. What you want to do is dash towards him and get behind him. He will always attack in whatever direction he was aiming in. So you get big opportunities to kill him after he's committed to an attack. He's big and slow. The dangerous thing about him is whenever he's already committed to doing a move and you're dealing with other enemies, if you get overwhelmed and there's too much on the screen, that's when it can become a problem. Swanee, deal with this. Thank you. You're glorious. Destroy this thing. Oh, I can see him tackling towards me. That's where it becomes a problem. I think his hammer just hit me. He has a really big shockwave attached to his hammer attack. I actually need to get hit a little bit here too. Actually. Why, why, big man? Because I need... Can you not apply it? Does your tackle do it? 
Mm. He also buffs himself. You'll notice he's getting bigger. No, he's not applying it. I wonder how I'm supposed to get applied to me then if I can't show it off. Oh, well, doesn't matter. You see this, uh, this fountain up here? These fountains can be found throughout Act 4. That little yellow debuff that I was getting towards the beginning of Act 4 that I was pointing out that makes you take extra damage. This is how you cleanse it off of you and get rid of it. You'll find these fountains at the beginning of the adventurer fight. I went past one already. Um, I think I've gone past like two or three of them. And I've been in the middle of other sentences before I've managed to talk about it. Uh, speed totem. Now we move faster and attack faster. Sword dude does his big swings. His shield bump doesn't matter. Look, he's, he's so slow. He bumps you away and it really doesn't matter what he does here. Dodge through him. That's what I'm trying to show you guys. Oh, look. Big dude upstairs shooting balls. Projectiles coming at me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dudes are doing stuff. I can dodge through that. We can kill this dude pretty quickly. Fulgent Dawn. I think just got rid of the healer guy. Damn it. I wanted to show you the healer dude. That little dude up here, he does a healing ability. I'm hoping that we'll find another one. Assassin. Remember what I said? Stay in the air. We've now got multiple dudes all doing their stuff together, making it a bit more tricky to commit to the strategy of one dude. So I'm going to divide and conquer. I'm going to have the assassin dude follow me. I'm going to bait big man to tackling. And now that he's tackled, I know he can't tackle again straight away. And I can take care of them one at a time. Move through. Now the healer dude. The healer dude, in addition to being healer dude who heals dudes, he will do this this animation like he's doing the cross on his chest. You know, name of the father and the spirit and the holy messing you up. He will channel a homing attack that just picks where you are and it will ping a little attack similar to the dinner bell maids in act two. That's, that's, that's all you really need to know because you can just walk away and it won't hit you by simply walking. But that's the only attack he has and a lot of people I speak to don't like that enemy because of that one attack. And I'm here to tell you that one attack you can just walk away from. It's not It's not the worst thing in the world. However, the way that it does get you is if you are stuck in the middle of like a whole bunch of enemies. The more enemies that are nearby, the worse it is for you. I'm trying to avoid these guys before coming in after them. Statues! Yay, we love statues. Kill the statues. Loot. Growing volition. We haha. <laughs> I don't need that. I can destroy that. Who needs growing volition? We're coming into the next boss fight, the second to last boss fight. I have one of my debuffs thanks to the statue back there, the big pulsating one. One. Cleanse. Bam, it's gone. Coming through the front door. Now Joan is wow, I just realized I've still got to explain Joan and the hero fight. This is gonna take a little bit longer. So, Joan is a two-phase fight. The first phase is an ad wave fight. Second phase, you actually battle her herself. She starts off on this big chair, hidden behind a barrier. We've already been exposed to this mechanic already. We know that we've got to destroy the totems to get rid of the mechanic. She's shooting balls from the sky. Dodge through the balls or space yourself in between the balls to avoid them hurting you. She's going to summon adds throughout the fight and do attacks herself. She's now summoning balls. You can... You can either jump around them, dash through them. They are projectiles. Homing, exploding dudes. Little guys down here. Get rid of them. Keep an eye on what Joan does in the background. Statues. She's summoning statues. These statues that come out have a higher than average chance. Dodge that. To drop healing orbs. So if you're a little bit low on life, you can kill these statues. And usually at least one of three, because they always come in sets of three, will drop a healing orb for you. Another set of statue dudes. It's actually pretty, pretty close together. She's summoning a big beam. The big beam is really close to me, so I'm going to dodge through it and move to the other side. Exploding dudes all over the screen. Trying to dodge all the exploding dudes. Statue stepped on me. How dare you? There's candlestick tossing dudes down here. I'm going to destroy the candle tossing dudes. I'm going to get over here and get the exploding guys to come at me. She's doing an animation in the background. She's dropping a giant wave on the ground. I'm going to dodge past the giant wave in the sky. I'm going to now do a little bit of damage to this totem over here while she's not doing anything. Exploding dude. Bait him into doing an attack. Come over here. Kill the little guys. She's doing her staff move. Raising the staff in the sky always means that wave is going to get sent out. Jump and dodge over it. Kill the candle tossing dudes every step of the way. They're really annoying. If you do get stacks of the... De Here comes the wave. If you do get stacks of the debuff from any of the enemies hitting you... You can kill the exploity dudes, by the way, by attacking them first. But if you're not doing enough damage, it's not worth it. Balls from the sky. Either find a spot to stand in between or just dodge through them. Um, as you would, say, the Chimera fight. Uh -huh. If you do manage to get stacks on you, which I have one stack on me right now, and you might be thinking to yourself, oh no, what happens if you get a lot of stacks? Do you just like start to die too fast? Well, good news. 
destroying these uh, pillars will remove any and all stacks on you. So I've now wiped out my stacks from the beginning, and I now have one more, so that you're guaranteed that by the time you get up to the Joan fight, you will erase all of your stacks. So I can start killing all these dudes. She will sometimes transform guys into tentacles, the same way that the ladies uh, who summon guys do. And that's basically it, I believe. The giant beam from the sky, the balls that come from the side, there's the giant beam. If the beam spawns on one side of the room, it was on the right side, it cannot reach you in the far corner. If the beam spawns directly in the middle, you're going to have to take a hit and probably like dodge through the beam or use, you know, a way to iframe through it. You can dodge through these balls that come at you. I try and get to the middle to make it easier to see where they're coming from, but understandably, there are a lot of enemies on the screen. There's a lot of stuff going on. This is the biggest cluster truck style of fight. I'm going to try and break this really quick. There we go. It's the biggest cluster fight in the game. It is understandable if it's hard for you. I'm going to pause for a moment and give you guys a piece of advice because you made it this far in the video, right? At any point, if you are trying to practice a fight, you are allowed to Alt F4. You are allowed to close the fight and restart it, right? This is a bit of advanced tech for you guys, special for you guys at the Joan fight right now. If I want, I could now close the fight, come back and practice phase one again. I can close the game entirely and reboot it. And whenever you do this, the game puts you back at the start of whatever room you just entered. Because we entered the boss arena, it'll put me back in the boss fight and I can do this fight again. Same goes if I start to lose, I can just close the game, come back in and try again. It's a good way to practice. Now, something that I should have mentioned way back at the beginning is, is rookie mode. And this is a really good time to show you this because I'm in the middle of a fight. Rookie mode in the settings will give you a buff that makes you take 50% less damage. And you can turn it off and on at any point in your run. Now, you'll see a little debuff, or a buff, I should say. This buff down here is the rookie mode buff. It is telling me that I'm taking less damage in battle. And you can turn this off and on whenever you want. So you can do all of Act 1 and 2 without the buff on if you want. And then turn it on for Act 3 and 4, etc. I recommend turning it on when you want to practice a fight. Because that way you take less damage. You're allowed to experience more of the fight. It's better that way. Moving on to Joan's actual mechanics. She's in the sky. She shoots three sets of beams. I'll explain those first two attacks when she does them again. These three balls rotate around the room. One, two, three, four, five, six. When she goes and does her best Arnie impression, she's going to send out six attacks. Shoutouts to the Hollow Knight fans who know which boss that is. It was Mamo, Mamu, the, the jellyfish. Um, no, I know who Mamu is. It's not Mamu. She will do six balls. You've got to run around. You can count to six and avoid them. This sphere has a terrible turning arc, as you can see. It can't turn for a damn, so you can just walk in a circle around it, and it can't hit you. She will summon tentacles. These aren't really much of an issue at all. If she teleports to the side of the screen, assume she's doing a beam. All right? Once again, she's doing this attack. It has a terrible turning arc. I'm going to go to the right and then go back around underneath it, and look, it can't get me. It can't turn worth a damn. It sucks. What now? Oh, she's doing it again. Guess what? I'm going to bait it. I'm going to dodge past it, and it can't turn. One, two, three, four, five, six. A lot of this fight is patience. If you want to be patient, you'll do fine. Balls. Get as far away as possible, and there's normally either a very obvious gap in between the balls as they start to spread, or you can just dodge through them all, right? It's not that big a deal. She sends the balls in and out whenever she feels like it. She really likes this attack. She does this attack a lot. It's funny because it's just so like non-threatening once you know how to avoid it. Do the circular beams. Circular. She summons dudes. The dudes do a pulsating attack that try to push you away. It's uh, it is annoying, but you can kill these guys. Dodge through. Beams from the sky. Just stand in between the lights. When the orbs are on the outside, like they are right now, rotating, it's easy to stay in here on the middle. But if these three orbs were on the inside, I'd recommend going to the outside platforms and dodging out here like this. But because the orbs are out there, I'm going to get hit if I go out, so I'm going to try and stay on the inside. Is this finally it? Good, 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 good. This rotating beam show right now, I recommend picking one platform and doing this. 
Instinct might tell you to follow the beams in a circle around the arena. That's only going to put you in more harm's way. I highly recommend just dodge through the beams. You can dodge through all of this. This ball explodes after it's done doing stuff, so don't stand near it. This attack right here, it's very generous with where you can stand. You can stand in between any of them. I walked up to nudge it to show you where you can, like, not stand. But it's very generous. You can find any decent gap and just stand still. I think that might be it. Besides the giant beam that she always does at the sides. Um, I think she's more or less done for now. Big beam. And she'll often do two of these together, so if she does one and comes back towards you, you got lucky. Because a lot of the time she'll do, like, back-to-back -back beams. And I got tagged a bunch there. <laughs> I got tagged. This is a really hard fight to get through unscathed. One, two, three, four, five, six. Most people will have a hard time getting their no-hit achievement on Joan because there's just so much on the screen. Balls everywhere, attacks all over the place. But pace yourself, bit of patience, you'll be okay, you'll get through just fine. All of the items that she has dropped. A lot of quintessences here, nothing I particularly want or need. Now, I still recommend finding the highest rarity thing. I see that the highest rarity thing is unique. Take a unique item, destroy it, and we are now moving on towards the climax of the run, the hero fight himself. One last time to talk to a rock if you've got anyone to upgrade. Because he's been a good boy, I'm going to upgrade Thief. I've got enough fragments for it. He deserves it. <laughs> Shoutouts to the MVP, little Thief. Doing all the best work in the world. There we go. These statues, they have one attack. The world's slowest swing. Does that mean it won't hit you? No, it can hit you. It, hit, it hits me, dude. It, it'll, it'll probably hit you at least once or twice. And it does decent damage, too. For all that it's slow, it hits hard. It's like the game's final way of trying to catch you lacking and hit you with stuff that you're just not ready for. Now, I'm hoping and assuming that you might be in the final area and you've got some money left because a last shop purchase is very, very good to make. And thank God it's something that I can make note of, too. Any food in the absolute final shop that says it lasts until three maps, three maps, three maps, means it will last long enough to take into the hero fight at the end. So this basic attack inflicts extra damage effect is going to be with us in the hero fight. Very, very strong buff for a bit of cash. 100%. Your last chance to find some good items. If there's anything that you find, go for it. But the shop becomes very expensive at this point. So, you know, maybe just work, focus on the food if you can't afford many good items. And then out we go. And we are approaching the last two room stretch. Take care of the enemies. I'll take this cash because why not? It's there. Thank you, Fulgent Dawn, for killing those two dudes who are already almost dead. Last stretch. Absolute last stretch. Look at us go, dude. It is that room, that time again. I want to give a big thank you to all of you for being here in this uh, beginner-friendly run. I'm very confident that not everything has been explained for you, but enough, hopefully, to get you through a few trials and a few problems with some of the enemies and some of the bosses in the game. Um, I know someone's going to ask, is it better to take item rooms or skull rooms in the beginning? That kind of decision is 110% up to you. It really doesn't matter whatsoever because you'll most likely find common skulls and common items in Act 1 and more unique items and legendary items in later Acts. Personally, I like to take skull rooms in the beginning and upgrade my skulls before I worry about items, but sometimes you're just, you know, you're given the rooms that you're given and sometimes you can't decide on what you want to do. But I try and focus skull rooms to get to legendary sooner because I know that getting my skull upgraded is more consistent than getting lucky and finding good items. But... That still doesn't mean you have to do it that way. You can alternate. You can do whatever you want with rooms. Play the way you want to play. And uh, practice, practice, practice. Don't forget that rookie mode exists. Don't forget that you can uh, close and reopen boss fights if you start to get too close to dying and refight them over again. Stand there and study what they're doing and practice what their moves are and get used to what you can do to get around what they do. Hero fight. This is going to take a minute. He runs around a lot in the beginning. He does dominantly one to two slashes. He's going to stomp and summon lightning around. This is pretty goddamn random. I would recommend dodging around and just like hope that you don't get tagged. But 
you're just trying to walk around like I was, sometimes it doesn't work. But in the beginning, a lot of his attacks are single slashes. He raised his sword and went, Ugh, which is my cue to say that he's going to do something nasty. I try and stay away. Like, he backed up, he's going to do some slash. Whenever he does rapid movement, watch out, right? Rapid movement, watch out. Ah, no. Poke him. No. Up and over. That sword has a massive range on it. It doesn't look that big, but it's pretty big. I don't trust it. He's not done yet. He's going to stomp. I'm going to hit him. Run away. Smack him. Run away. You can play the poke game. Up and over. Bait. You're playing bait and switch. Nope. Nope. I don't trust it. I don't trust it. What? He stomped the ground. I'm going to smack him. Smack the ground. He smacked the ground again. I'm smacking. Oh, oh, he baited me. See that? He did it. He did a thing. The hero is one of the hardest fights. All right, I'm going to try and like dodge lightning this time. There we go. Dodging is a lot easier. I recommend standing on him and getting some free hits, but that's just me being masochistic and wanting to trade damage with him. Don't do that if you're not confident. Don't do that. He's going to run around, do moves. He's just, he's just stomping the ground now. Balls. Here we go. This is a uh, phase 1.5 style move. I'm pausing for a second. When he gets low on life, he'll start doing new moves. The hero is a very complicated fight. He technically has like four phases, but he doesn't have true transitions the same way that other fights do. He has obviously phase one, two, and three, but there's like many phases throughout. As he gets lower on life, new moves come out. He's now doing one right now. He sends out shockwaves on the ground. When he throws three balls in the in the uh, in your face, you can circle around them like you do the enemies in phase four, in uh, act four rather, the, the the homing yellow balls, or you can dash through them. This teleport slash that he's doing is really, really mean. You just have to react to him being behind you. He's doing the whole nothing personal kid. He tries to grab you. Basically, whenever he like dashes at you, dash past him. Because some of those dashes, he's trying to yoink you and throw you at the wall. Two, three. He does three slashes there. Setting at the balls. We can circle these around us. Like that. Two, three. Clap him. Sky lightning. I'm going to start running along, and if I see a red on top of me, I'm going to dodge. Slash. Dodge past him. One, two, three. Smack. Get around him. Dodge on reaction to the nothing personal kid. Dodge past him. That was a grab. Going over him. One, two, three. Smack, smack. Try to grab me. He's stomping at me. See, he will sometimes chain... Oh, no, I'm staying away from that. He'll sometimes try and chain abilities together. And, and catch you off guard. Always stand away from him here. Flash, dash, flash, dash, flash, dash. Whenever you see the lightning flash white, do your dash to avoid the red the red lightning afterwards. That ball right there, it will always hit you on the wrong side. You want to stay to his back as far away from that giant red ball as possible, and it won't hit you in the corner. If I was standing in the other side when he was doing that attack, I would have taken damage from the ball's explosion. Having said all that, I do want him to do more here. Two, three. Punish. Skylightning. Uh, 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 uh. Lucky us. Uh, take that. One, two, three. Are you seeing the pattern here? You getting the idea? He grabbed me. I didn't dodge. I didn't follow my own advice. Always, like, jump up or dodge through his, his, his dash. Dash through that. No. And see, he tried to, like, combo a grab attempt into a teleport. Now, this attack right here, you can dash through the... You bastard. Through the balls. <laughs> and it will destroy the balls. But be aware, he is a very intelligent boss, and he knows how to how to stop you from doing the things you want to do. He's cheeky. I'm going to have to lure these balls in a very awkward pattern here. Nice. He does ultimate moves sometimes. I'm, I'm waiting for some of these three. He's not doing them. So he sent the wave across the room. That's what the adventurer does. He, he does it very fast, mind you. So that's why I like to be away from him sometimes, because he does some range attacks that are easier to avoid from a distance. He's not going to do the others, though, is he? He has his rapid slashing move that I want to see him do, but he's not going to do it. All right, this. Flash, dash, flash, dash, flash, dash, flash, dash, flash, dash. If you just dash on every white lightning... You'll catch the red lightning. That's for a double dash, by the way, if you've got a double dash skull. And you don't even have to worry about seeing where the lightning is. Just always do the dashes, and you'll always avoid it. Three. I'm not going to punish it just yet. Do your rapid multi-slashy move. Do it. 
He's not gonna do it, is he? You're gonna be a bum. There we go. Okay, phase two time. Phase two always starts exactly the same. He always summons a bunch of swords, right? He will always summon swords to the background. He's going full Gilgamesh mode. And he then grabs these swords and does attacks on you. And you can always react to when he teleports to you. And dodge out the way. See? He's coming towards me. Dodge out the way. Towards me. Dodge out the way. Now he's going to go away and fire beams. He is grabbing each of these swords. He has two swords left. Tackle. He's too far away. The last sword disappeared on him. Swing, swing. Ultimate poke. He has big, nasty charges and big palm attacks. The tackle. Go through the tackle. The stomp. Jump it or dash through it. Tackle. 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 Stomp. Once again, this is like a technically two-phase phase because he does more moves as you weaken him more. Which is why it looks like he's not doing that much in this phase because he's not hurt enough yet. I'm keenly aware that I might lose my first life trying to show off what he can do. But he is really... Are you stuck in a loop? All right, he's summoning more swords. Back to this again. Dodge, get a hit. Dodge, get a hit. Dodge, get a hit. This can be an ability too. Doesn't it be a basic attack? You can do an ability on him if your ability is fast enough. That palm right there, that palm attack hits so high and wide. The best way to avoid it is to go through him. Don't try and go over him. Go through him. All right, here we go. Avoid the red. As soon as the red's on the ground, dodge away. Stand in between the lightnings. And he's now coughing blood. Chance to get some damage in. I'm not going to do too much because I don't want to over-trigger his, his phase. Run away. Run away from the giant greatsword attack. It's very mean. Now, we're in jail. We're in jail. Jail sucks. Get ready to react. Avoid that as best you can. Dodge through the tackle. That's the palm. Dodge into him. Tackle. Dodge into him. Stomp. Jump it. Stomp. Jump it. Stomp, jump it. Are you serious? Tackle. I was about to jump. I'm like, oh, dude, he's got me in a cool pattern here. Tackle. Get away. As soon as he jumps and throws three swords to the ground, you know it's going to be trouble. Just avoid that the best you can. I think it's time to push him to the next point of his phase. Yep, he's doing slashes. That stuff right there. He's now, like, in, like, phase, like, 2.5. He's doing extra special attacks. We want to get him to about half-life. Now this. Ready? I'm going to get away from the red and stand right in between the lightning and lose my life like an idiot. <laughs> I like how I had to say, watch this before I get hurt. Now, he's at half life or less. He's doing his transitional ability. Dodge through the nasties and then stand away. He explodes afterwards and then normally does a big special move when he's done doing that. And now put me in jail. I tried to avoid it. If you move fast enough, you can escape jail before he puts you in here. See the hitbox on that? Hit me in the, in the sky, dude. Oh, uh, light beams. Light beams are annoying. Try and dodge into most of his attacks. No, 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 no. I need enough life to deal with his uh, final phase. I can't be getting hit too much. Hey, maybe I'll get a chance to show off the uh, Alt F4 strategy. <laughs> um, try and be in the air when he does that. A lot of his attacks hit very, 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 very vertically. Uh, horizontally, rather. Not vertically, horizontally. It's hard to avoid that in time, dude. We're in jail. And I'm losing a lot of life here. Take care of that phase. Right. Final phase. Final phase, daddy phase. Ah, oh, can I afford to stand still? Can I afford to show off what he does? Final phase of dad, you really, really, really want to stand close to him. I'll show you. If you get too far away from him, he also does the whole dashing, snaking, chasing after you thing, right? And it's very, it's scary because he gets to you really fast and he's trying to punch you. That right there, he's trying to grab you. If you stay close to him, he will always try and do these swinging punch attacks. And more often than not, some of these punches will send out rocks. The rocks can be completely null and void if you're dashing past him because you will you will basically like dodge the rocks as they spawn at the same time. He's going to stomp. He does damage on the ground. I'm going to lose this life, aren't I? No, I got to show off more. See, staying close to him is just infinitely better. I think there's only like one more move to do anyway. I need him to do his... Uh... 
is a uh, beam. Do your beam. He's weak enough now. He can do the beam. Do the beam. He does a big Kamehameha beam, and all you have to do is get behind him for it. There's the beam. Get behind him. He's going to cough up a bunch. Uh, Swanee can deal with this. Yay! <laughs> I'm on eight life. <laughs> Don't uh, spend and uh a stupid amount of time uh talking about the hero fight and not completely paying attention and rambling as you do it or you might come close to dying on a really strong werewolf run but in any case that's from start to finish the hero fight and the rest of the run the hero fight is very very complex i highly recommend i highly recommend turning on rookie mode for that 50 percent damage reduction that is the only thing that changes one of the best things about skulls uh quote easy mode with rookie mode is that it doesn't change how many enemies spawn it doesn't change their rotations what what abilities they do it doesn't change the phases of the fights it doesn't add or take away anything it just makes you die slower so you can learn the fights easier for example if i had turned on rookie mode i might still have my first life right now and not be almost close to dead um there's no shame no harm no foul no anything turning off rookie mode is what you want to do to, to test yourself, basically, to see if you can do it. Um, but that's from start to finish, the idea behind it. There are a few very niche abilities that the hero has not done in this fight. The hero has so many attacks and abilities that he can do, it's actually obscene. It becomes so difficult to keep track of all of them. I have over 900 hours of experience, and there are some abilities that I've seen maybe like like 20 times ever. And there we go, a very over-explained run from start to finish to give newer players a bit of insight into Skull, into how to get around some of the more annoying enemies in the game, the boss fights, etc. Um, for the final time, I'll say that if you're having a hard time with the adventurer fights, um, I still got that link that I'll put in the description below uh, for how to handle each individual adventurer. And then for like, say, Act 2 and 3, where you get two and three enemies to fight at once, you take all that advice, you kind of just like put it together for each one but I'll leave that link down below and every adventure is explained in that. But besides that, I'm, I'm hoping that this is a good idea for some of you. I haven't gone into extreme detail with things like inscriptions and, and the actual builds themselves. It kind of comes down to the easiest way for me to explain building a run. If you're doing a physical run, try and take physical items. If you're doing a magical run, take magical items. There are far more niche builds in there, but besides that, it gets a lot easier to... Um, build your run in the beginning by just combining, you know, attack types. My skull does magic damage, hate stone increases magic damage, I'll take the magical item, how about that? It's a lot easier in the beginning of the, of the game to do things like that, and then later on down the line when you get more accustomed to items, what you like, what you don't like, you can start mixing in things like, oh, I'm gonna put a lot of attack speed on this skull and then take this one item that does more damage the more I attack, that way I ramp up my damage really quickly, you know, fun, roguey synergies like that exist in this game all over the place if you want to get a good head start in just having a decent strong normal run something like what i did in my previous run just now is just take strong items and put them together you know just oh that gives me more physical damage oh that gives me more physical damage put them all together and get good returns and last but not least don't forget to invest in the witch traits i know i hammered this a lot in the beginning but this really is very important the game might seem a little grindy, but believe me, it is worth it to get some of these quartz things filled in, especially Reassemble and Ancient Alchemy. You've seen how important Ancient Alchemy was in that run with me getting extra money as I went. It might seem like a very different run to what you like to do, um, just because I have this alchemy trait alone. If you don't have it and you just watch that run, you might be saying, wow, that's amazing. I, I don't have that kind of money in my runs. That's why you really, really do need it. But with all of that said and done, I've got to get out of here. I hope you guys have enjoyed this beginning to end long boy run. I apologize for the length of this. It's going to be an, an absurd, I can tell. If you have any questions related to Skull the Hero Slayer, feel free to drop them in the comments below and myself or someone else from the community is sure to give you some advice. Um, I recommend both the Skull the Hero Slayer Discord, their Twitter, my discord because i'm kind of like the guy who plays a lot of skull around here um shameless plugs if you want to join um areas to ask questions you can any of those places are great places to ask questions you'll get a lot of answers if you're a new player um yeah and i will see you all next time <laughs> have a good one